uh, the main thing is too, there's other congregations involved in this thing and it's just a good way to connect and just interact and just be involved at a big level. Hey, you guys played like musical chairs. Not everybody's in the same spot. That's, I thought you guys would get like bid spots or something. The fairs have moved up front. <laughs> They've taken over the front. <laughs> That's cool. But I've just noticed that people are in some different places. I'm like, what? Usually people lock in. So that's cool. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I'm keeping an eye on you, Destiny. She told me she, well, she, told me she wasn't going to take a nap. That's right. Today's not a nap day, right? I told her, if you fall asleep, I'm calling out your name. So I already did it. Just a... <laughs> See, you should have seen her eyes when I said Destiny. <laughs> okay. You guys good? You guys doing good? Man, I appreciate you being here. I really got emotional yesterday when I stood up here in the morning. I, I felt that way a couple times yesterday. I was like, wow, just thinking of you guys being here and just the honor of what we're doing. And just good. It's just good. Let's pray. Let's turn our hearts to Father. Can we do that? I want you to just take a little time. I'm going to open up my heart and just love on Him a little bit and let Him love on me and you let Him love on you, okay? Remember, you live by faith. It doesn't have anything to do with how you feel, guys. How you feel has nothing to do <laughs> with the gospel now it can in time and it'll flow by grace but but in the beginning sometimes you just have to go to God by faith so let's go to him by faith there's times I went in my bedroom to seek him and didn't really even feel like any sense of anything real and God would come and reveal himself in times it was amazing so father we just look to you right now by total faith some of us have a knowing in our heart more than others right now but no matter what, we've read your word. We've seen that you've sent your son and you said, I love you through Jesus Christ. And Father, we come and receive that love this morning. Thank you. You're not mad at us. You're not ashamed of us. Your brow isn't raised towards us. Your arms aren't crossed. You love us. You love people. You love people to the point of sending your own son to redeem our lives, to bring us back to you, to cause sonship to flow again very freely. Oh, you didn't pay a price to get us into heaven. You redeemed sons and daughters. And you put heaven right on the inside of us. Thank you for raising us up through your Son by the Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now in our lives. We thank you that you desire to live inside of us. We appreciate that you come to reveal Christ to us and show us even things to come. You've come to reveal all things that the Father's speaking. Holy Spirit, we honor you and we welcome you. We thank you that you're becoming our best friend and we thank you that you're leading and guiding us in truth. Lord Jesus, we want to honor you this morning and we ask that the revelation of who you are and what you've accomplished would explode in our heart by the grace of God. And we just thank you. We just thank you that you've made it all available. You've made it all possible. You wanted to. It's your idea. You did this thing called the gospel. It's all you and we thank you for it. And we just honor you and worship you. In Jesus' holy name. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to begin to just, uh, whether it's in your heart or you whisper it out or you just speak it out and the person beside you hears, it doesn't matter to me. But I want you to begin to just speak out of your heart. Father, you love me. Father, you love me. You're not ashamed to call me your son or your daughter. You made me completely clean through the blood of Jesus. Jesus, what you did was enough to redeem me back to the Father. I'm excited to be yours. And I'm so glad you love me. I appreciate you fathering me. I appreciate you not leaving me lost, giving me hope, giving me a future. I appreciate you, Jesus, coming in the flesh and modeling a life that I was created for, to show me the truth, to get me out of the dark, begin to talk like that to him, to begin to express just a level of thanksgiving. Uh, guys, I don't care if it's just raw faith right now. Uh, if you don't feel like doing it, that's a good time to say, flesh, who are you to get in my way? My heart wants to know God. Begin to talk to the Lord right now. Thank you for your love for me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're making this real to me. I am not backing down. It's, I'm not going to live by how it seems, by how I feel. Your word is true. Your word is life. 
Your word is true. And I'm believing today. And I am not backing down. If I'm accepted today, I'll be accepted tomorrow. If you love me today, you'll love me later today. Because your word says your love never fails. There is nothing that can separate me from your love unless I believe wrong things and take a step back. And even then I'll find one day you still love me. So I am not backing up. I will not be deceived. I'm not going to grab onto useless things and old ways of thinking. I'm holding fast to you. Thank you, Father. You believe our lives are so worth living. Thanks for loving us. Say it personal. Thanks for loving me. I do that about a hundred times a day. I do. It just comes out of me. It's, it's, not even, it's not that I've created a habit. It's just it's fun to know that the God of the universe loves me and knows me personally. <laughs> Some people are striving for popularity. That's pretty popular when the God of the universe knows your name. <laughs> pretty pumped (laughs) so just get real with that come on and don't be afraid to believe that in Jesus name thank you father amen amen I want to encourage you to continue to pursue God we're going to talk probably get in this week to uh, really communion with God I have to lay yesterday I felt like I opened a whole bunch of doors that now we have a couple weeks to close <laughs> just what I felt like we did. Kind of felt like we went and just threw out some stuff and kept building and I opened other doors and I didn't get to establish certain things. I just kind of scratched some things open. So, uh, but there's something really big on my heart right now and uh, it'll lead into communion and fellowship with God and it's called your right standing with God. It's righteousness. It's something I love to preach. If you look up there on the wall, you'll see it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's amazing. And his righteousness, he wants to be yours. His nature, his character, the expression of his heart, his ways. Uh, And he made us right through Jesus Christ. And I want to show you today in the Bible how right you are, how free from sin you are. And uh, I'm not being arrogant when I say this. I don't care what anybody says. The Bible says you're free from sin. There is people that, 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 that butcher this topic up and keep the church sin conscious. It develops works and legalism because we're afraid that if we preach it the way it is, it'll give people the excuse to sin and it does the total opposite. I did not find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free from it forever. That's why I'm a happy man. I've, I am. I, didn't, I don't put a jacket on for you to try to impress you. I woke up happy. <laughs> you, you follow me? I go to bed happy. I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and I'm happy. Not, oh, no, yeah, three, three o'clock. I'm, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just happy. <laughs> and I don't seem to be able to do anything about it. <laughs> Like people say, well, you can't smile. I just said, I don't think you can. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what to do. It's truth that makes you free. It's good tidings, great joy. If you understand the good tidings, there's great joy. So there's, there's, a, there's a realization if there's not great joy that we really don't understand the good tidings. That we're letting a lot of other things determine our lives. We're giving ourselves to other things. Our minds, our emotions. We're making things bigger than they are. I mean, sometimes just something that an important person in your circle of friends says or doesn't say about you can rock your world because we don't have this established. Just one little statement. Just somebody could say something. They said what? They said what? You know what I mean? I had a pastor years ago that he used to say to people, and I used to get a kick out of it, because he'd say, hey, man, uh, you know, I really think you're awesome. I don't care what the devil's saying about you. You, hear, you, you heard what he's been saying about you, and they, what, what? And he'd get real like, what? He says, what do you care about it for? It's just a lie anyway. Why do you want to know what he says? <laughs> so he was just kind of stoking them a little, and they, but they'd fall right into it. They, what, like what's going on around about me? What are people saying? And they'd fall into it all the time. I'd watch people do it all the time. And the other thing he would do is he'd call people a man of God and they'd go, 
like, who, me? Oh my God, there's nobody else here. <laughs> You're talking to me? <laughs> it would just, you know, or hey, woman of God. They think the secretary was behind him, you know what I mean? It's just funny because it shows that we really aren't confident in who we've become through Christ. We all want to go to heaven. We all want to have a good life. We want to experience joy. We want to experience love and friendship and all that stuff. But, but guys, I'm going to be real straight with you. I'm, I'm a real straight, narrow guy. You can't find yourself except through Christ because nothing was made that wasn't made through Him. Your roots are Him. Your, your identity is in Him. You, you can't find yourself apart from Him. And that, that makes the world mad. They want universal peace and everybody to get along. Well, we can still love people and get along. I can be in a room with anybody and have peace. I'm not trying to bend their arms behind their back and get them to pray my prayer. I can love people and have peace. It doesn't matter what you believe. But for me to have security and true identity, it's going to come through Christ Jesus. I find myself through Him, guys. Or I'm on this rat race trying to find myself through life. Trying to get everything to go the way I need it to be so that I'm okay. Come on, that is... The ones that are older in life know that that is the most miserable way to live. Some of you younger folks could be right in the heat of that now and find yourself in it for a long time. It, it, it actually, it never changes. You, you don't grow out of it. it you, 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 you change because you change your perspective, your mindset. Like, you got to know who you are through the finished work of Christ. You have to know who the Father, how He sees you, who He is and how He sees you means everything. And the way He sees me today, that's what makes me who I am. And He is steadfast. He's not, he's not up there changing His mind. He's not pulling Michael or Gabriel over and saying, can you believe He's doing that? Can you believe He's... he's no, He loves me. He loves me. And here's the deal. When I wake up in the morning, I don't have other things in my heart. I'm not playing games with my conscience, my heart. I want to know God. You guys aren't in this school, hopefully, because you're playing games. You're in this school because you're saying, I want to know God. I want to walk in a sense of God reality like I haven't known. I want to understand who I am because of the gospel. Right? So, so who of us is just saying, who woke up this morning and said, man, I wonder how I can just sin and live immoral and, just, and, and still find a way to be okay. See, even if you get those passing desires or pulls and tugs, I don't believe they're coming out of our heart. They can, but in most cases they're not. Because those are the things that when they flash through you, those little temptations, desires, you Ugh. Or, eh, why did my do you know <laughs> right <laughs> well the only reason you're doing that is because something inside of you changed somewhere along the line through Jesus you care now at a level you didn't care before come on there's things that could pass through my mind that I'm like duh where before I used to conjure them up <laughs> like I was the one responsible for it being in my mind do you understand and now if it would come through my mind, it would be like, duh. Yeah. But thank God my identity is secure enough that if that thing does pass through my mind, I'm not going, oh my God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> because I know in my heart, that's the last thing, I don't even, that's, that is stupid. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? But our innocence has been violated along the way. Some of us have just thrown away our own innocence. Some of us have willfully run head on into that stuff in our lives. So things that used to own you come back and check in with you. Things that used to walk you around like a puppy. That's exactly what... I got a picture that, that Satan had me on strings like a puppet a long time ago. And I thought, see how emotional I get? I'm like a roller coaster inside. You have no idea. I'm like, I smile one minute. I'm like, right now I feel I'm just... He used to play me like a puppet. And when I saw that, I said, never again. You are not playing me ever again. You used to use me and own me and mock my created value through my sin and my willfulness and my pride and make a jest and make nothing of who God made me to be. Uh, you ain't putting me on your string anymore. 
Bible says, don't you be unaware of his devices and you give him no place. I'm telling you, there's a place where you draw a line in your heart. And you say, you know what? I'm either for him or against him. That's not legalism. And that's not over militant. It's the truth that will spare your conscience and your own heart a whole lot of grief. Because it's when you're not sure and when you kind of got one foot in and one foot out and you, you're like, you want the gospel, but you want this other stuff. It's the passing pleasures of sin. Even if it seems exciting, it can't be. It can't produce lasting fruit. It can't be in the long run. Even if it seems exciting. Because isn't there a lot of luster to a lot of things? Moses in Hebrews came of age. Why don't you look at that? I don't know how, man, where are we going? I went from Colossians 1, which I really want to preach. <laughs> but I'm not in charge. <laughs> and I trust the one that is, is right. Yeah. Thanks, God. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 11. This is amazing. What did I miss? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Hebrews 11 Moses he's in Hebrews 11 yeah he's not just in the Old Testament <laughs> he made the New Testament <laughs> now watch this this is a big deal this is cool. I, I, and I'm excited. I, I'm not trying to exploit all the young folks here, but I'm excited to see you guys here. Thanks for being here. It's good. I got a bunch of teens back here from Harvest Chapel. It's good to see you guys. Watch this. This is good. Yeah, it is good. By faith, verse 23. By faith, when Moses, when he, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid watch this they were not afraid of the king's command there must have been a place what this is saying there must have been a place in their heart that they said you know what we're gonna we're gonna hide him and 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 they realized that if they did get caught doing that or something they'd have probably all died right but they're figuring you know what we're not going to get caught there's something about this boy we ain't giving him up we're trusting god you know what I'm saying? And it wasn't even that they, it just sounds like they weren't even afraid that it was going to cost them all their lives. It wasn't even like a risk to them. It sounds that way. That's pretty cool. See, I want to get to a place in faith where I'm not, where faith to me isn't, oh God, I hope you pull through. Yeah. Man, it just isn't like that. It's just not like that. So watch this. By faith, by faith, Moses, now, now listen. By faith, Moses, when he became of age. Isn't that a neat phrase? Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he began to gain understanding. He began to realize some things. Some things began to unfold in him. It's like a young person growing up. They begin to get more of a developed conscience. And there's an age where all of a sudden they know that they know. Do you understand what I'm saying? That age can vary within a few years span different people different makeups personalities but there's a time where you become of age the Bible the definition for sin in the Bible is he that knows to do right and doesn't to him it is sin that's the New Testament definition of sin in the Bible and the other one is anything that's not a faith is sin that's two New Testament definitions of sin now I'm not saying that to get people to feel muddy I'm, I'm saying it just he, he did it so your conscience so God gives us this great gift and grace and sense of consciousness and, and, and like my mother I always said my mother she didn't know a lot about when I was growing up about the things I'm teaching now or what I hear in the church but she believed in God and was a Christian and, and, and she, she's alive when I say was doesn't mean she's not here sorry but I just mean when I was growing up so I grew up in a Christian setting as far as my mother was concerned but very limited but what I got from mom was 
just a real sense of right and wrong. She instilled that in me. I knew that from little up. Mom seemed like a wholesome lady to me, seemed innocent. She was very beautiful when I was little, and everybody thought she was like just so beautiful, and she was just sweet. She just seemed like somebody, she'd sit on a stump, and the animals would walk near, you know? She, she, was, she was just like that, and, and she'd wear her hair up in one of them high thingies, you know, and, and uh, spent a lot of time with us. She was at home all the time, never drove a car. She was just with us, and 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 I just, at a very young age, I remember having a consciousness of right and wrong. And I think that's natural in a lot of us, but I had it to a pretty good degree. So that can be trouble when you don't want to do right. Because <laughs> it put me through a lot of hell, <laughs> especially here. Because <laughs> of, uh, well, I tell the story a lot. When I was 19, I threw my Bible against the wall, screamed at it like I was, just screamed at it like it was a person I was mad at. I'm telling you, it was a bizarre, I was losing it. It's because I met Kim, my, my now wife, and I was 19 and she was 23, and, and I was going to be bold, the tape's running, and I'm just going to say it like it is. I wanted to sleep with her. I was 19, and I thought, she's 23. I want to I wanna make it with this 23-year-old girl. That's where my heart and mind was, and I grew up Christian. And I'm not thinking Christian. She just got saved six months before. So she has a fresh thing in her heart. She came from a background of just a mess, and now she's saved, feels clean and pure, and now she's got this 19-year-old knothead in her life that's not thinking Jesus, thinking flesh. But I'm willing to talk Jesus to stay in. Now I'm getting real. Are you a Christian? Well, sure I'm a Christian. I'm thinking, isn't everybody? She says, you're good. Well, I know my answer's got to be yes, because if it's no, then we ain't got this possibility. If I say no, I probably am not in. I'm out. And I'm not thinking God. I've just gone to church for years. I'm getting real. So I tell her, we sure I'm a Christian. Oh, good. She said, oh, bless her heart. Because she has vulnerability. She has weaknesses. She's six months old in the Lord. She's got stuff in her life. And if she didn't, she'd have recognized me in no time and said, you need to go get a grip, pal. <laughs> what do you mean you love me? You don't love me. You love yourself at the cost of my own flesh. You're trying to live at the expense of me. Why don't you go find Jesus? Boy, I wish she was strong enough to say that. Maybe I'd have listened. Because I did like her. But I would tell her I love her. No, I wanted her. And there was a night that I tried to make this thing happen. And it was so convicting. You have no idea, man. She's like, Dan, what are you doing? And I'm thinking, duh, you're 23. You've had several long-term boyfriends. What am I doing? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and I'm, that's what I'm thinking. And I would kind of ignored her and just kept pursuing. And she goes, Dan, what are you doing? And I'm like, what do you mean? What am I doing? And she said, we're Christians. Six months saved, that's what she said. Looked me right in the eyes and said, we're Christians. And I'm like, duh, yeah. Whoa, man, what was I? Sorry, girl, you just do that to me. You know, you're just all that, and I'm, it's hard for me, you're so. And I tried to use that worldly flatter, you're all that, and you turn me on, you get my fire burning kind of stuff, right? And she's thinking, oh, I don't want you like that. <laughs> so this girl's sincerely pursuing truth in Christ. And I'm pursuing, now here I am, for nine months engaged to her, and I'm determined to cross that line before our wedding. And she said, there ain't no way. So now I feel challenged. And I'm per <laughs> so, so I crossed many lines and watched her cry many times and do things that she didn't want to do. But she wouldn't, you know, that home run idea. She wouldn't cross that line, but violated her conscience many times. And, and just as well, probably it's the same. So, I, so there I am living, selfish at her expense, telling her I love her when it's hurting her. Now, she wasn't jumping all over me and saying, hey, this is great. She was crying, feeling pressure. And I did that to her. The night she said, we're Christians, I went, oh, forget, I backed off. And, 
inside I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That's what I, I was, oh, you have no idea how lost I was. I'm going home and I'm so mad at the gospel. I'm blaming it on, the, on God because he didn't let me have my way with this 23-year-old girl. He got in my way again because I just came out of a relationship with an 18-year-old girl who didn't have a daddy. Boy, you're finding out how much of a wretch I was. I'm glad this guy's dead. <laughs> this, <laughs> it's so good this guy died. <laughs> you wouldn't even let me hug you. Because <laughs> I love this girl. Oh my goodness, I love you. I think about you. I, I just bless you when I think about you. I, uh, I had this girlfriend, 18 years old, and she didn't have a daddy. And I thought, hmm, I'll slide in. She's vulnerable. I'll slide in and pray on her. She needs a man in her life. Well, she did. She didn't need me. And the gospel kept getting in my way there, and I did my best to get around it, but she was trying to be a Christian. And the last thing a young lady needs at 18 when she's really trying to pursue God is some knucklehead in her life like me that's playing the hypocrite. I need to change. I don't have to be a knucklehead. I'm, I'm not created to be a knucklehead, but I'll tell you I was. So that relationship, that girl looked at me one day and said, you know, I don't really know even who you are. I don't know if you know who you are. That was God talking to me through an 18 year old. And I'm like, whatever. And she says, well, this relationship has to end and I can't continue in this. And, and then I said, fine. <laughs> Plenty of fish in the sea. And I walked, so you tell me I had anything for this girl. It's pitiful. So, I get with Kim now and this night happens and I get to my bedroom. You have no idea how, how lost I was. I, I couldn't wait. I was so mad when I got to the bedroom because this, this gospel cost me my desire. And I'm certain, I didn't even know where my Bible was. I remember pulling open a couple of drawers. My Bible was lost. <laughs> and I found it and I was like, there you are. <laughs> You know, I had it in like under some underwear or something. <laughs> and at that age, they might not even been. <laughs> just I'm kidding. I'm just having fun. I'm keeping you guys awake is what I'm doing. <laughs> I know exactly what I'm doing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Brandy, is the camera on? Oh! <laughs> Internet people, hold on, we're coming back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are, we're trying to come back. If you don't stop laughing, we're not going to come back. <laughs> See how I blamed that all on you quick? <laughs> Here's what I did. I found the Bible and I went, you, serious. It was like I was out of my mind. I remember it. it, it I don't even want to forget that stuff. It's sobering to me. It's because I, I, I'm not guilty of that. I'm not the man that did that. See, I understand. I understand the gospel so clear. I can talk about this. I am so free from who that man was. But I don't mind remembering that because it is sobering. It is like, whoa, what we can be without Christ. Whew. You get what I'm saying? So I don't mind knowing where I came from to see where he's brought me because I know the man I'm describing to you, it's like, oh my goodness. Because that man is dead. You understand? <laughs> But watch this. I screamed at that Bible. And this, watch what came out of my mouth. I, I remember like close to word for word. I know a couple things I said for sure. But I remember saying, I hate you. I hate you. You're always in my face. So I was screaming. I wish I didn't even know what you said. I wish I didn't know one thing that's in you. You're, you never leave me alone. You're always in my face. I said, I hate you. I wish I'd never read you. I wish you were never read to me. I said, you never let me do what I want to do. I hate you. And I threw it against the wall. Screaming. Because one 23-year-old drew the line and stood in integrity in a level that all she knew had a conviction to draw that line and said, hey, what are you doing? We're Christians. And I was like... <laughs> I was glad to say I was a Christian because it was convenient. But man, I didn't want anything to do with surrender, commitment. I didn't even know what any of that meant. I didn't even know. I remember slamming that thing against the wall. 
And I went to a friend's house and they had a bottle of vodka there. I was so mad. I said, give me that bottle. <laughs> and that changed a whole lot. <laughs> Boy, that really helped things. <laughs> I woke up sometime later feeling a whole lot better. Yeah, right. <laughs> The dumb things we do, huh? Driven by who? Self and deception and just chaos. Duh. Still ended up marrying Kim and lived for 13 years and put her through hell because of selfishness. There was never a man of God to her for 13 years. And she was a very sweet, sweet lady the whole time, doing her best, and I dried up her heart at some point, and she couldn't hold on any longer. And we were about to get divorced and I said, great. What am I wasting my time with her for? That's how bad it was. My heart was so lost. And in that season, Jesus came, not because I was crying over my marriage. I was thinking, great, more fish in the sea. He came and delivered me. 30 minutes after I got saved, I thought of Kim. And the first time in my life, I knew that I loved. It's because love came inside of me. Because I really got born again. Because that night I died, I didn't want to be me anymore. And I was so done living me. I was so done. You got to get to the place where you say, you know what? I don't want the flesh, the devil. I don't want sin. I don't want violating my conscience. I don't want desire that doesn't produce long lasting life. I don't want this. Some people say, what happened to you, Dan? Well, there was certainly a grace over the whole thing. But one thing I saw was, I didn't want to be that man ever again. And I know on that night, that man died. What some of us do is we ease our way into death. And we kind of die. But we reserve a lot of other things. And we slow die, slow death. Die. (laughs) Come on, if you're going to shoot me, shoot me in the head. Don't shoot me in the ankle and then raise it up and hit me in the thigh six months later and then shoot me in the belly. Shoot me in the head. Are you getting anything out of this or am I way whack today? (laughs) I know one thing. The born again experience is so real and so powerful. I didn't go to one class on love. It's a supernatural thing. It's not something you live from your head. It's something you live from your heart. You catch it here. Isn't it amazing that I was so selfish, so wretched, and in my heart I thought I was the most selfish person on the earth. That wasn't an overstatement. To me, I need to see that. It doesn't matter if you lived more selfish than me. To me, I was the most selfish man that ever was. And to me, my life was pitiful. And when I got real with where I was heading and what I was producing, it was zero. And I'm standing there bawling, saying I'm a hypocrite. My life is pitiful. I'm so selfish. Pitiful. I'm bawling. I'm like, I am so lost. And that night, I gave myself to Jesus. Isn't it amazing that 30 minutes later, I went to work so hard and so calloused and so cold and so uh, the day before or so I told Kim how nuts she was and how her whole family thinks she's crazy and how I married a crazy girl and you're nothing but da 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 and all she was was a, a poor young lady that thought she married a Christian that struggled to survive and I'm just ba 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 I go to work, I give my life to Jesus in the spirit of Almighty God. He didn't come and sit on the rack and look down at me and say, oh, so you want me now. So now you want to change. Well, you caused a lot of hell, you know. Well, you got that poor girl Kimmy hurting and you hurt a lot of people along the way. I called you for years. In fact, what was that thing about throwing me against the wall, the word of God? all those years ago you haven't changed any since that you've never said you're sorry for that now I'm just supposed to believe you and I'm supposed to just trust that you're going to change now see that's what we do to each other that's how we've learned to live 
Thank God some angel didn't come sit on the rack and talk to me like that. The instant that I was sincere about letting that man die is the instant that I'm not that man anymore to God because that, it, regret produces death. I can't go back and rewrite and change anything. I can't take those words back. I can't take actions back. I can't go re-erase the Bible hitting the wall and pull back and take... That all happened. But guess what can change? Right here, me. And as soon as I was changed that night, as soon as that stuff changed and I wished I could have went back and relived my life, God said, forget it, we'll scrap that and we'll just start over. You, you don't have to relive that life. We'll just get it right now. We'll make you brand new now. <sighs> Isn't it amazing that the Spirit of God came into me and 30 minutes later after I went ballistic, you have no idea how, you just don't. I jumped, screamed, I twirled. I was at work in the aisle, supposed to be pulling my order and somehow I got my work done that night and still was on computer standard. You know, Rick, what I mean. I, st I wasn't behind on minutes. Somehow God does stuff. I remember ministering in an aisle to somebody one night and they got healed and they were weeping and I was going after the spiritual juggler in their life. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm supposed to be doing this order and we're on computer and when you punch in, it tells you if you're late or on time or ahead of time and I'm thinking oh God this is going to be ugly because I finally got up I thought man I'm going to have to really work hard to catch up but that was so worth it I swiped my thing and I was like two minutes ahead it's, it's, it's impossible I stood and administered this person for longer than the order was supposed to take I pulled the order after ministering longer than the order was supposed to take then I pulled the order Hyperspeed, of course, but I was already past the time. Because I went, oh. I said, it'll just have to work out. <laughs> what? <laughs> Life in God. It's really fun. <laughs> the Spirit of God came in me 30 minutes after going ballistic for, it seemed like 10, 15. You have no idea. I just kept running around going, you're real. Oh my God, you're real. <laughs> you have no idea. It was crazy. I would just take three steps and go, <laughs> you're real. <laughs> what allowed that? Well, of course we're saved by grace. There's a couple things I did that day. I completely surrendered the best I understood it. I saw the wretchedness and called it what it was for the first time in my life. I didn't soft pedal it and talk around it. I looked at the ugly and called it ugly. I looked at the lifeless and called it lifeless. You get it? And I said, this is pitiful. And I knew in my heart I didn't want another minute of this. And I said, if you're real, because I didn't even know if God was real, I was so lost. I had no sense of God reality, if you're real. If you really love me and can forgive me and have a plan for my life, this is the best I understood, this is what I said. I said, have a plan for my life, I will live for you. I raised my hands like this and said, I will live for you. I was looking at the metal rafters and the spirit of almighty God came down upon me and came inside of me and I went bananas. I'm still going bananas. I just calmed down enough to talk to you because <laughs> if I was going bananas I wouldn't make sense I would just be going bananas but I've done my share of going bananas <laughs> but I need to be of sound mind so I can <laughs> oh you're so good how is it possible for 30 minutes later to think of a woman that you could have cared less what happened to her and already had your sights set on an eight-year younger woman. See, when I was 19, see what we do to each other? When I'm 19, it's intriguing that she's 23. Now I'm 33, and now I'm looking back at 25. You follow me? And, 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 and I, was, I was making plans. Didn't do anything with it, just making plans. The instant the Spirit of God came into me, 
30 minutes later, I thought of my wife. And when I thought about her, my heart groaned. And I felt sorry for her. I, I felt a lot of feelings. And all of a sudden, I realized I loved her. That doesn't even make sense. It's because God is love. <laughs> and I am 30 minutes old in the Lord. <laughs> Yay. And because of surrender and believing he forgave me and not going, man, I really blew it, man, I really. See, a year and a half, almost two years ago, the Lord told me in a worship service the reason he said, do you know why you live the way you do? Well, I knew what he meant. He meant the way I live because I live with me. <laughs> he meant the consistency, the joy that nobody has any right to nobody has a right to what's in my heart it's it's mine from him it's just good and I live a certain way and I'm not dejected and downcast and I don't live through periods of fear and anxiety and discouragement and I don't struggle I honestly don't I live very free and the Lord said, do you know why you live the way you do? And I said, well, yeah, because you're amazing and your grace is sufficient and your love abounds. And I answered all the right ways that we should answer. I heard the Lord chuckle. And he said, well, no, Dan, not exactly. And I'm thinking, that's blasphemy. That's not even the voice of God. That's the devil. <laughs> it is grace. It is. You know, I'm thinking that because it is God's grace. We understand we're saved by grace. It's all him. Without him, we're nothing, right? We know that. That's not spiritual, religious cliche. That's truth. But this voice goes, huh, no, Dan, no, not exactly. That's, that's not the answer I'm looking for. And I'm like, I'm actually thinking, what? Because it's what all of us would have said. He said, no, Dan, it's because the night you got born again, and he pointed me to that night in the Iowa. He said, on the night you got born again, you were sin conscious for a moment. And ever since that moment, you've been a son in your heart. What he's telling me is because of that, all that grace and magnificence that he is could come on me. I didn't restrain it. I didn't hinder it, Chelsea. It, it could come on me. It's not like they're waiting to dump. And we're like, well, I don't know why he would love me. Well, the thing that you're thinking isn't why he loves you. He loves who he created you to be. He wants to get to the real you. He loves who he created you to be. He loves your destiny in him. He loves your purpose in him. He's so wise in making us and creating us. He loves that. He's preserved that through the blood of Christ. It's always possible. He's kept the potential alive for your destiny. So when you look at that, I don't know how he can love me. It's because you're weighing yourself based on all that yuck. That's not what he loves. That's not what he sees. That's not who you are. So on that night, I died to that. And ever since he said that moment, because I know what he meant. It was about a three-minute moment. I was so aware of sin, I thought I would die. It was just bleh. And I know some people, you know, they were afraid of condemnation. No, there's, it's important to face that stuff and take ownership and say, you know what? I haven't been sincere at all. Oh, my God, I have false motives. I have to know. I have to know. Oh, God. And we try to point to oh, Now, look, God loves you. Don't get condemned. No, nobody needed to touch me for those three minutes. Because in them three minutes, I am coming clean. I am coming out. I'm coming out of this shell. I'm, it's like, you get what I'm saying? But ever since that moment, I've been a son in my heart. Now, do you think I've done everything absolutely cookie-cutter perfect since that day? I'd like to think so. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> I'm having so much fun this morning. I hope you're having half as much fun as I am because I'm really having fun. I'm glad you're here. It's just, I'm having fun. <laughs> I'm really having fun. Look, I'm a son in my heart. 
If I stay a son in my heart and understand he loves me as a son, I'm going to continue to produce the fruit of sonship. I'm not trying to be a son. I already am. I'm not trying to bear fruit. We talked about that yesterday. I'm not trying to be an apple. I'm not a cherry tree in the orchard. Cherries. Because if that's how you produce cherries, you're going to start feeling proud about yourself. And you're, somebody's going to need to pat you and give you a trophy or something. Super Christian. I don't know. <laughs> cherries produce because they're hanging on cherry trees. The trees already know they're cherry trees. They were cherry trees in the seed. Nobody had to tell them. That night I became a son. I was already a son. I was in seed form. Jesus died and fell to the ground. He's springing up bearing much fruit. That's amazing. So things were sown into my life, my whole life, and were laying in the corridors of my heart, my mind. That's amazing. And all of a sudden, I just fascinates me, the supernatural power of the gospel that through surrender, and a born again experience that I could think of someone that I had no feelings for and instantly knew I loved them. Called her on the phone right away to tell her about this amazing experience. She was sitting at home drinking a mixed drink, smoking a joint of marijuana. Imagine that, my precious wife. It's so funny. That's what hurt can do to you. She's sitting with this real young girl out back that I used to call a biker chick. And I was just envious because there was motorcycles would park in her driveway and not leave till the morning. And I used to wish I had a motorcycle. I'm just being real. I used to think, I was just mad because all these guys are parking there. And I was just, just, I was lost. So I used biker chick, biker chick. She's just this, she's just that. I'd say that to my wife. And the whole time I'm, I'm just envious because my marriage is dry and my heart is dead. And now she's with this girl. So they're friends. And she's in the yard at age 36. And she says, you know, it'd be just like my husband to call and say, I found the Lord. (laughs) Now that this thing's finally over. And I called 10 to 15 minutes after she made that comment. (laughs) She's crazy. (laughs) And she hung up on me. And probably poured another drink. (gasps) Just give me the bottle. (laughs) And when I came home, she was waiting for me like a cat. I don't know where you girls have that button that... (laughs) 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 I don't know. Because I ain't never seen her like that. There was some button somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) My wife was soft and quiet and timid and meek. and, And I used to lash her with my tongue and just cut her to pieces. And on that night when I came in, she had hackles. I walked in, I went, whoa. If it wasn't for the Spirit of God that just came into me, I'd have probably ran or been in trouble. Because I wasn't going to fight her. You should have heard what came out of her mouth, and understandably so in the sense of the flesh and the natural, because nobody was teaching her what we're teaching. She was just drying up because there was no love in her life. How dare you try to pull something like that after all these years putting me and these kids through hell. I know you. I know you by now. You're just trying to come out of this thing smelling like a rose and make me look like the witch. It ain't gonna work. You're a fool. And I'm standing there going, thinking in my mind, God's real. I was still serious. I was so undone. I'm standing there and I'm trying not to be, because I can see that. And, and, and I remember feeling like, wow, I created a real bad situation. But it wasn't like I was like, oh my God, I'm so guilty of this and that. No, it was like I had a different hope, mentality, perspective. Isn't that amazing that all that was in me as if somebody taught me that and I was saved for about couple hours 
But I remember standing there, she's doing all this thinking, God's real, God's real. And when I went in the bedroom, I said, wow, I have never been what I was created to be in this marriage. I have never been a man of God. Man, it has nothing to do with Kim. It isn't her fault. It doesn't matter all the stuff I blamed on her. I have never lived like Christ in this home. I said, if I would have lived like Christ, these things wouldn't be. I take it off of her, God. I don't hold her for nothing. I said, I take total responsibility for this marriage and I put it in the altar of your mercy and I ask you to grow me up in you. That was my prayer. And I quit trying to convince her that I'm changed because insecurity drives that stuff. You just need her to love you. No, I want it to be right. I'm like, honey, look, I've changed. I'm smiling today. I never even prayed for our marriage after that. I never tried to compel her, convince her. I just spent time with Jesus. And time revealed my sincerity. A good clincher was she came home one day to catch me on a day she wasn't expecting me. I wasn't expecting her home. She was just supposed to be out of town for the whole weekend. She rolled back in, snuck in the back door because we just let our house hang open. So if you want to come over, it's just hanging open all the time. <laughs> it's, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just the way I live. <laughs> it's, it's just always open. And... Uh, she comes sneaking in the back door to catch me yelling at the kids or doing something like I used to do. And I'm sitting Indian style with my 10 and five year old on the floor teaching them songs about Jesus. And it really messed with her head. <laughs> it really did. She was like, <laughs> I was like, Kim, did you forget what, what? Nothing, nothing, I'm fu- nothing. <laughs> she took off upstairs because she, she told me later she was so rocked she didn't want to believe what she saw because she wanted to have a right to be angry. And then God sealed all that up and healed all that up and there's a long story, I won't go into it, but isn't it amazing that when you're sincere in your heart this way, things can automatically change and you were never even taught. It comes with the package. Sometimes we're trying to fill it here and then walk it out. Do you get what I'm saying? And, and, and the sincerity of your heart to God is huge. You making contact this way from the sincerity of your heart and getting real with your own heart, your own life, and with God will transform your life, guys. You keep your conscience squeaky clean and clear. Because even if you stumble, you, you, you go, duh. Because you're not, you don't want to stumble. So you're like, duh, that is so not who I am. Instead of, oh, look at who I am. That's what we do. I can't believe I just did that. I've been saved two years now, and I just, I should know better. Duh, you dummy. If I didn't get it by now, I'm probably not going to get it. I wonder if I'm even saved. I don't even know if my heart's pure, because here, that's what we do. The reason you're frustrated, the reason you're mad at yourself in the sense of being tempted to feel that way is because you don't want to do that. You get it? So why are we wearing that now? Instead of going, whoa, I am so glad for the light that you've put in my life, in my heart. And I just so thank you that you have sanctified me and separated me and showed me truth. That is so not who I'm created to be and who I am. That's not even my heart. God, I thank you that in weakness you make me strong. You love me, you nurture me, and you just robe me in righteousness. Thanks for being my father. Thank you that truth is fathering me. You're fathering me. Thank you for making me clean in your sight. You say, Dan, you can't pray that way if you stumble. That's the only way scriptural you pray. Show me another way. You confess it as that's not me. That is not you. That's not you in me. And he's faithful and just to forgive you. So you already have relationship here. It never severed. I'm not trying to get back to God. He's in me. I'm not trying to rebound. Why? Because I'm not losing my identity over a stumble. My identity is through his resurrection. You follow me? Because if not, you're going to get into legalism and you're going to walk on eggshells and you're going to try not to sin instead of enjoy being a son. Do you know how many people are trying not to sin because their hearts are pure? 
But in the process of trying not to sin, they're very aware of every little mistake. And some of the purest people are the most condemned and the most critical on themselves. And the reason is, is because their hearts are actually pure inside and they don't want to miss it. And now they think they're constantly missing it. And the devil's just, oh, ah, mm, ah, well, why were you thinking that? Well, if you're a Christian, well, if you're a pure white, mm, ah, mm, ah, ah. That's what happens. The only reason it's trying to eat you alive is because you care inside. You're alive inside. God has something to work with. It's what Satan's threatened by. He's trying to kill that, quench that, cover that over, hide that, push it aside. Because the pure in heart are going to see God. You get it? Come on. You can't, you can't walk through life and bump into the flesh and go, Oh my God, I'm nothing but flesh. I'm a carnal Christian. No, you bumped into the flesh. And you went, whoa, God, thank you that you are growing, cultivating, and maturing my life. There's a time in my life I wouldn't even blink an eye. That would all actually seem normal. That is so not who I am. You've got to let that be known. That is so not who I am. And that is so not who you are in me. And I thank you for the power of your gospel, your blood, your love that sets me apart. And I thank you for washing me making me wiser, sharper, smarter. Thanks for making me strong. In the midst of that, you can know him more and manifest him more. That's how powerful the gospel is. In the midst of that. (laughs) Why? Because you run to him and thank him for his goodness. That's not an excuse for sin. That's cultivating you, maturing you, growing you up into him. Adam and Eve did what we do. Why are we doing what they did? Why are we running, losing our identity, half naked, ashamed, fig leaves, trying to cover? All that is a sign of is self-conscious. The whole fig leaf cover, the whole garden thing. They became self-conscious. Before the tree, they were God-conscious. God in them. Sin makes you self-conscious conscious he destroyed sin in its power he made you free from it that's the scriptures that I wanted to go to but I had to show you that when Moses came of age and get into all that stuff I got into there was just it's just the way the school is going to be so it's just sorry I don't have a plan but you, you just got to learn in this school to grab those things and go okay yeah hey oh, and then we'll go right to where, wherever we are but that's why it turns you there. Because actually Moses, he chose rather to suffer affliction in verse 25 with the people of God than to enjoy the what? Passing pleasures of sin. So he settled and said, you know what? I'm not missing out on anything. It's all passing and coming to nothing anyway. There's this luster to it. It seems like desire to it. But it's self-serving. It's self-centered. It's at the cost of people. I mean, look at comedy. Look at worldly comedy. It's just at the expense of people and their identity and their esteem. It's just, it's just bashing one another and we're all laughing. It's not even humor. It's, it's sin. Stuff like that. I don't even know why that came on my mind. But esteeming the reproach of Christ. <laughs> Like, like the little criticisms around, wow, well, you're a goody-goody. Well, you don't even, well, you don't even have any fun. You're not going to sell that one to me. I'm having so much more fun than the person that's living the deepest in sin. I promise you. Because I have peace in my heart. That person living in sin, that millionaire that's living the way they're living and they got their yacht floating around and they got the young girls on the weekends on their yachts and they're doing all this stuff, man. It's always happening. They're trying to fill something that only Christ can fill. They're trying, and it's, like a, it's just like anything else. It's, you have to keep taking the shot in the arm. You have to keep, and it becomes more, and it consumes you more, and it drives you, and it owns you. You have to do it more to stay okay. And the more you do, the more you have to do. And it's like addiction. It's like drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, sexual addiction. It's all that stuff. I, I was outdoors before I was saved, hunting fish, hunting fish. I'd just stay out of home, hunting fish, get away from home. I didn't even want to be home. hunting fish, just hunting fish. And it just drove me. It was the same as an alcoholic. I, I, I mean, I, I needed hunting fish anonymous. <laughs> HFA. I needed FHA. 
I was I turkey hunted this year. I enjoy hunting. I, but I, now I have a whole different view. It doesn't drive me. But I, I was teasing my wife because I, I really enjoyed turkey hunting and I had a good season. And I said, honey, this got in my blood. I need, I need TA meetings. I got to go to THA meetings. I, she said, why is turkey hunter anonymous? I, I think I got bit by the turkey hunting fever. She was like, oh. <laughs> Because I was laying one day taking a nap and I know I heard a turkey gobble in my bedroom. And I, and I said, Lord, this is going too far. I just took a little time off, enjoyed the mountains and just had some good time. But I was, I was laying and taking a nap and I was in my bedroom in the middle of the day and it, taking a nap and I heard, I was like, and I, I don't know what happened, but I was like, I was looking for him. I peeked out the window, is he in the yard? I sat up in bed. I said, God, I think I need help. <laughs> THA meetings. If you hear of any, call me. Uh. No, I'm actually good now. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Why? Because heaven and earth are passing away. His word remains forever. The things you see are temporal. The things that are unseen are eternal. That's what living by faith is all about, guys. Martha and I were talking about scripture yesterday, 1 Peter 4, 1. It says, if Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same mind, for he that suffereth in the flesh will cease from sin. There's a place for putting down your flesh, for not feeding the appetite of the flesh, for not letting the flesh voice that you've been trained by and I've been trained by have a voice anymore. I remember walking in to pray already, saying, flesh... You're not in charge here. I don't care how you feel. We're seeking God and we're praying. I would say it out loud and slam my bedroom door because I didn't feel like doing nothing. And I would say, flesh, it, you're not in charge here anymore. You've lost authority. You follow the spirit of God that's in me and you agree with the soul that I possess. I'd slam the door and say, we're seeking God. Father, I'm here and I worship you. And, ah! and on those days, I would have the most incredible encounters because it would have been so easy to just be a blob somewhere of flesh and just go whatever man well I just ain't feeling it dude you don't live by how you feel you live by what you believe and what you truly believe is what you manifest and pursue your life lived determines your faith your life lived you're judged by your works that's because your life lived is the expression of of your heart belief. What you live is what you really believe. That's not a harsh statement. That's a sobering statement, but it's not harsh. It's just true. There won't be a lot of questions in the end. Did you believe this? Did you believe Your life will reveal what you believed. So we have to learn to live by faith. We have to learn to how to express that faith because if not, you, you believe Jesus is Lord but yet you believed all these other things that cause you to live as if he's not. So you got this counter thing going on. You see what I mean? And then it puts you in turmoil. And then it hinders your ability to what? Approach him. Because you got all this static and all this muddy stuff going on and you don't feel clean in your conscience and clear in your face to look up and say, thanks for loving me because you don't feel lovable. Or you feel like you're failing. Or you feel like you're not as good as you should be. Or you're not doing as much as you should. And you got yourself in this way scale now. Now you're identified through your life instead of his life. And you've lost sight of truth. Are you understanding this? Okay. Because I want to show you. Well, this is this, this, is, uh, this, this thing in, with Moses. I, I, I really hit hard earlier. And I, but I did want to wrap up and read this couple things. Because it's really powerful. By faith, he forsook Egypt. So do you see what he did? Because there was a real draw. Egypt, come on. He was living like a prince in Egypt, right? So, but I mean, is he's living like, he was a prince. So he has that lifestyle of a prince, right? So he's living like a prince. Watch. By faith, he forsook that. Come on. In that day, he didn't have what we have to step into out of herself and into Christ. He's stepping out of a prince into bondage and slavery and the oppressed people of the Hebrew people. Come on. That is a different picture than we've got. 
<laughs> we're stepping out of the muck and mire and perversion of the world and self-centered, self-seeking lust and desire, and we're coming out being sanctified, set in the kingdom of his love, and his spirit comes and fills us, and he cuddles us and coos us and puts us to sleep and wakes us up and walks through the day with us. <laughs> It really can't be that way, by the way. <laughs> he is forsaking the life of a prince to go with these guys that are in making bricks for Pharaoh. There's a lot of connotation. You know that's the land of bondage. It's type and shadow. A lot of analogies with Egypt. Like that, that, that actually represents sin, the bondage of sin, the land of Egypt. They're under... They're under the control of another, a taskmaster. They're in bondage to Pharaoh, type and shadow of Satan. Trapped under sin. That's where the terms deliver muck and mire, hog back to the mire. That's where it comes from because they were daily in the muck and mire. They were in that mud, slopping, and slopping in it, making bricks to build another's kingdom. You get it? That's what sin is. It's actions that build the kingdom of another that you weren't created to build. You're created for the kingdom of God. Sin builds the kingdom of another. So it puts you under that bondage. So you're in the muck and mire. It's the muck and mire of sin. He saved me from that muck and mire of sin. I'm not treading in the mud anymore. And I'm not making bricks for Pharaoh so he can build his monument. That's what the Hebrews were trapped doing. And oppressed doing. They were laboring under the taskmastering of another building his kingdom when they're created as the children of God. You see the paradox? See how wretched uh, 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 even the ignorance of a life of sin is. That's why you come of age. The gospel enlightens you. It's just good to hear good, clear, sound preaching because it puts conviction in you. Conviction means light. Okay? Okay? This is good. I want conviction. When I was younger, I didn't want conviction. I was mad I had it. So there you go through seasons in your life where the flesh is roaring and raging and you don't even want to hear truth. I had a man in a mall a little while back. I was talking to a young man in a mall, two young men. And they were athletic and we got talking. And I just stopped and I grabbed a bite to eat and, and, and he was there sitting and we got talking and he's a big boy and he played football I asked if he had any injuries because I was trying to set him up to love on him pray <laughs> so he said no he said but man my buddy his knees all messed up uh, or his back's all messed up and I said really you're back he said yeah I said man you're a young guy how old are you he's young 20s I said listen man I said the reason I was asking him I said I, I, really I wanted to pray for him he's like oh, and he's looking at his buddy like thanks buddy for telling this guy here, the, the big guy's a pastor's son. He's got his beliefs, wants to talk theology, wants to little rebuttal, little debate. Well, then how come stuff? You know what I mean? I don't have time for any of that. This is pray. This is, <laughs> that's just pray. Because it's, it's contention. It's not even sincere asking. It's just contention. It just, and now I'm just not going to stand there and argue. And I said, listen, man, you got nothing to lose. He's saying this, and I understand there's a lot I could respond to, and I'd rather just get it on. Let's just get it on. Let's just pray. And he said, no, man. He said, I, he says, you, you want to pray for me, and I get healed. He said, no, I ain't praying, because if I get healed, that's going to change a whole lot about what I finally have set up as my belief system. And I said, what? That's what I said. What? Wow. I said, man, come on. I said, you can punch me if you want, but you're getting way too old to think that foolish. I said, what are you saying? That doesn't even make sense. That's just you self-preserving your own beliefs. This is with God. If you get healed, who heals you? Will be God. So you're avoiding and running from God, and he's the truth, and you don't want to know the truth. You want to be your own truth, so that makes you a God to yourself. Come on, that's ridiculous. Now, that, now that's prayer. <laughs> he said, no, man, get off my back. Look, now you're pushing me. I said, no, I'm not pushing you. I love you. I can't believe you're, you're standing here openly embracing that mindset when you in your own heart know that it's zero. I can't even believe you're defending that. You don't even believe what you're saying. You just don't want to encounter truth. You're in hiding. I said, let's just pray. I said, and, 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 and his buddies, and he's, he wrestled me a little more, and his buddy said, well, how long is this all going to take, man? <laughs> I said, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds? We're just going to pray. Yeah, we'd be long done. I said, you know, we'd be long gone by now. He said, 15 seconds? 
Because he's a pastor's son. He's got a lot of religion. I could tell him. And, and, and I looked at his buddy. I said, setting you up again. 15 seconds, man. Come on. You got nothing to lose except the belief system. <laughs> he said, well, my knee's all messed up too. It's funny how when you get ready to pray, they tell you the other stuff when he's acting like that. But he says, my knee's really messed up too. Tore it, tore ACL and da, da, da. And, but he said, it's my back. That's, my back's a wreck. He said, it hurts 24-7. Pressure in there, da, da, da. I said, okay. I said, well, listen, I'm going to do you a real favor. And I'm not even going to embarrass you, man, because God's not trying to embarrass you. We're in a mall. It's a food court. There's people everywhere. I'm just going to keep talking to you just like we're talking. Nobody will even know I'm praying. And I'm just going to keep my eyes open. And you, you, I said, God loves you, man. I said, so, Father, I thank you for this man. And I just kept like I was talking. And he's just standing there like, Dude, are you even for real? Are you what, what? And he's not, he is not on page. He is nowhere even close to on page. And his buddy's standing there like, whatever. Prayed. I said, I need you to check your back, man. Just, just move it around. He went, oh, God. Oh, God. I said, no, it's all right, man. Check it. Look, man, I just, I'm just, I said, look, I love you. Go ahead and go if you have to run. But your belief system, I'm telling you, it is going to change. He said, look, man, I'm just, and he just took off out of the mall. He, he had no pain in his back. And he was so shell-shocked because he was so sure nothing was going to happen. Now, you think he'd cry and repent and fall on his knees and talk to you or hug you. No, he was willfully holding on to what he wanted to believe in God in his love. God's love was right in his face saying, eh. <laughs> Now, if you don't understand God's love for people and you're trying to get them on page and get in position to be healed, you're going to be way late in their life. God's already in position. He already raised Christ from the dead because he already put him on the cross. He raised him from the dead. So heaven's already in position. It's just waiting to land. <laughs> and we're the ones like the little paper airplanes and the rubber bands or something. We just, shh, heaven. <laughs> so, but this, this, this young kid took off running because he didn't want his belief system challenged, but who knows that there's no way to get away from that. So you trust him to Holy Spirit and you just let him go. And he just took off. And he ran out of the mall. Oh, hang on. Oh, we have a question and it's not going to come on the, the, the internet, folks. So no, it's not okay. They need to know your question. I did good, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was thinking he was going to have to interrupt me because I told him that's going to have to happen. You're going to have to interrupt me. Holy Spirit's amazing. I just have a question. I just want to make sure I heard you right. So you said um, you don't have to, you know, teach the guy. Holy Spirit already has him set up. Jesus died on the cross for him. You're there. Just let me pray for you. That's all I wanted to do. Here's the deal, Jennifer. These signs follow those that what? So who's the sign follow? The believer. So what's it have to do with the person in need? I, sometimes it's, it's helpful. Sometimes, sometimes I think we teach because it builds our own faith up. <laughs> and we're trying to get stirred up and feel in position. I'm just being honest. <laughs> so sometimes we raise our voice and quote scripture because we're trying to find the spirit. <laughs> And he's right there. <laughs> he's definitely right there. <laughs> Having so much fun with this, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Come on, don't we do a lot of stuff? It's that self-conscious thing. wonder if we're really Christ-conscious. You know? Like Jesus in the Bible so many times. I mean, he's walking and people just run these incredible situations up to him and stuff. Or, you know, there's just... There's just Jesus, there's guys just they can't even see. He's like, What is it you want me to do for you? That we might see. Do you believe I can do this? Yeah. See. Other people would even say, Do you believe I can do it? Some people they're just using to test him, withered hand, test him to accuse him in front of the crowd. Because they know he's gonna heal because he's a pushover for healing. He's been healing everybody. You gotta have a devil. <laughs> That's what they're thinking. So they bring this man up. He's a scapegoat. He's a guinea pig. They point to him on the Sabbath. Hey, is it lawful to heal? And they point to this guy. The guy's just in exploited. Hello? So is there faith in his heart? Is there faith in the people's heart? No, the whole reason they're pointing, they don't care about the man. 
There's animosity. There's hypocrisy. There's, they're trying to trap Jesus to accuse him publicly. And they're using the guy to set him up. He's bait. Now if Jesus has what has the theology we've all grown up with well they have to have faith they can't have fear <laughs> they have to this they have to that all of a sudden we got 30 reasons why men aren't healed <laughs> well if Jesus had that book in his back pocket he'd be in trouble right now <laughs> well there's too much unbelief in this atmosphere I don't believe the spirit of God could come I'm going to go where God is wretched people If you change, God might come. (sighs) He is not intimidated by that. He's the truth. He's the Christ. He's the Son of God. We're sons and daughters of God. And the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. So if we can get the same eye, we can do the same thing. If you believe like I believe, if you see like I see, Matthew 17, you'll do what I do. Period. So it's just cool. So there's that man with the hand, and all he did was, he said, man, you guys, who, who of you having a sheep falls into a pit, wouldn't pull it out on the Sabbath, so therefore it's, it's all right to do good on the Sabbath. Sir, stretch forth your hand. He didn't teach him. He didn't try to draw faith. He didn't get him to nod his head yes and agree with anything. He just said, stretch forth your hand. We've seen this thing as far as people saying they don't believe in God. They don't believe in healing. Now, most of the circles we were trained in, that is an automatic, and eh, God ain't showing up. If they're standing there saying, I do not believe in Jesus. I do not believe in healing. Verbally out of their mouth, they're already eliminated in most of our circles of teaching. They cannot be healed. Well, then we got a lot of explaining to do. Where God does, because we've seen a whole lot of those folks healed. In fact, you, you run with Todd. He, he likes when they say that. Yeah. He's like, oh, is that okay? Is that cool? Is that, is that true? Okay, well, cool. Well, give me your hand. Just... Now, what do you say to that? <laughs> you know, on that one video, he's like, the girl's a scientist going to the science. Well, now here's what's going to happen. God's going to grow out your leg right in front of you, and you're going to scientifically explain that, Okay. Leg grow. Now you scientifically. Okay. In most of our theology and what we grew up in, she can't be healed, and what she doesn't see determines what we do see, and we let her unbelief dictate our faith instead of Christ crucified. Our faith should be dictated by Christ crucified. So yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. It had nothing to do with him. It has, here's all we need to do. We need to keep growing in this love relationship and not be self-conscious, growing in this love relationship and realize that we're representing Christ on the earth. We have the green light and he loves everybody. wonder if we'd stay that simple and throw away all the books that are written why it won't happen. Because you can't believe how that stuff infiltrates your mind and sets up little camps of strongholds. And beep, beep. and then when you start praying and something doesn't seem like it's happening, you fall back on those couple things that you were taught. Well, it must be this. It must be that. They must have issues. They must have unforgiveness. They must have hidden sin. They must have. And all of a sudden, this whole list is active in you. The reason Jesus didn't have that book in his back pocket, it was never his experience because he is the revelation. We need to honor that. The only reason we have those books is because we're trying to explain our experience. But in explaining it, we continue allowing it to be our experience. We probably ought to follow Jesus on this one. Wouldn't you think? And we'll get on this and this and this is a hot topic. Actually, this whole healing thing, we didn't even get on this, the healing part till late in the school last time. It was probably the 10th week, 11th week, we got real big on healing, real big. But it was probably, I'm not sharing this for any wrong reason, it was probably the most trying time of my Christian life in teaching, when I was teaching healing in the school last fall. I I cried a lot because I felt like we, we couldn't hear. I felt like we have so much intellect in this area. We've been so engrafted with other stuff and testimonies and teaching and people's experiences that our experiences rule us in this area. It's how it felt. And it was like I cried to Pastor Don and I said, I'm really 
I'm really, I don't know what to do. I feel my heart's breaking. I feel like we can't hear on this topic. I would explain it, uh, stuff for a half hour and, 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 and someone would just raise their hand and ask a question in light of what I just, as if I didn't even speak. Well, then how come? Well, what about? Well, why? And it, and it was as if we couldn't hear. And I'm not blaming the school. I'm saying we have been so engrafted with other things to believe and we've embraced them so wholeheartedly that when the, and that's the plan, believe me, of the enemy, that when the clear life of Jesus is in front of us, we can't see it or grasp it or adhere to it because of all these other things. Now that could be in any area of your life, but it was really big in healing last school. And the students didn't know. I didn't want to, I was, because I'm not, I don't get, I'm not like, boy, these students got to get with it. It was, it was no, it was nothing about it. It was just, because if it was in that room of those hungry people that made the commitment to be in this school and it was in our 10th week of school and we were experiencing that, who knows, that's a widespread thing. Well, it's everywhere I travel, actually. And it's like, ugh, because we have built doctrine based on what we've been through and what others have been through, not what he's been through. And the book's already written. Why are we writing other ones? If you can't find your theology in the life of Jesus and in his words, then throw it out. We say a lot in the area of healing that Jesus never said. We came up with it because it's the way that seems right. And it gives us a false sense of comfort with no increase of power. It puts a ceiling over us. When you embrace one of those 30 reasons why men aren't healed, if you embrace just one, you just put drywall over your head. Because that one reason will pop up in your conscience. And you'll just lay it on that. And you'll step back of faith. Right. Well, she said it's, she thinks we do that personally because we don't want to feel like we failed. Well, see, we're not under that kind of pressure. We're privileged to grow up into him. It's not about failing. I'm not under the pressure of failing. I'm privileged to go for it. You see what I'm saying? So I take that serious. There's an accountability there. There's a soberness there. But I'm not carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. Jesus did that. So when I pray for a little child, I, I want to know that I'm doing everything I know to be in the position to give her the kingdom and pray, but I'm not carrying the weight of failure. In fact, if she passes on, it just causes me to be more sober to know that I'm in a place I need to grow because she can live. I've settled that a long time ago in my heart. And it's not that self-conscious, self-preservation. Watch this. If you're trying to protect the feeling of failure, who are you protecting? yourself it's still all about you it's not about you at all it's about Christ in you the hope of glory it's not about protecting yourself ever that's what happened through sin self defense self preservation self conscious fig leaves naked shame running from God self conscious God comes in they hear the sound of the Lord coming and they run watch self conscious look at the, the drastic change in sin whoop God conscious, self conscious. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me close with this thing on. This is how Moses lived his life the way we were just talking a while ago. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of a king. So he's not looking over his shoulder for the devil. Hello? Boy, I just really ministered, man, and I know the devil's going to get me now. He's out to get me now. That's what people think. You want your eyes on Jesus because if the devil does show up, he'll get so exposed by the light you're walking in and you're just not going to fear him. You don't fear him. Remember yesterday, not in any way fearing your adversary. For he endured, here's, here's what faith does. He endured as seeing him who's invisible. For some reason, the sensuality of man is coveted that we don't like to live that way. And it's the greatest way to live. Because then I'm not ruled by my feelings anymore. You, you, if you ever start just living by faith, you'll be so glad because you'll realize how, how awful it was living by feelings. 
That's like the wind blowing the water and the waves just to and fro by the wind and the wind changes and the waves change and the wind changes and the waves change and the direction of the... That's how people's lives are when they live by feelings. It's just crazy. You're not created to live by feelings. You're created to live by truth. Truth has nothing to do with your sensuality. You get it? So watch this. Does God love you? then what does it matter if you don't feel like he does? If the answer is straight up, he does. You have to start there, camp there, and let that revelation overtake your sensual life. Do you get it? If you scripturally, theologically, doctrinally, positionally know that God has to love you, then what's it matter if it doesn't feel like he does? You have to start, he loves me. And you have to get alone and declare it and talk to him and commune with him as if he's sitting on the bed beside you. Because I'm telling you what, you do that by faith and you cross that barrier where you crush that sensuality and you break those strongholds by just, just sheer faith where you're not even attacking strongholds. You're just pursuing truth. All of a sudden, truth is in your bedroom. I'm telling you, I, I started going into my bedroom, closing the door behind me because it was an act of faith because I believed when I went in there, I was meeting with him. Theologically, I knew he was in me, but that was a meeting place. So I'd close the door on the way out, which I always left my bedroom door open, but when I got saved, I started closing it because I'd have to open it to go back in. <laughs> and I'd go in. All the funnest part was closing it behind me. I'm here. <coughs> Click. It's just us now. Thanks for loving me. Thanks for this gospel. Thanks for being my father, separating me from darkness. Thanks for loving me with unfair. I wasn't even doing that a week by faith. No, I shouldn't put time on that. Oh, God, forgive me. Oh, because people, we do it. We time for, we, we, that, that we try that for a week and see if it works for us and we're 30-day money-back guarantee people. We live by faith. Faith isn't something you try, it's something you become. Okay, so forget that I did that week thing, but I did it for a week. I I don't even know if it was a week, but there was a little time where I was just doing that by faith, and all of a sudden I would close the door and begin to open my heart and speak, and I wouldn't even get a sentence or two out, and the tangible presence of God would just come and envelop me and hold me. And I'd be like, oh. I'd slide over the bed. But before that ever happened, I was there knowing I was meeting with him. So now God could give me a stewardship of that tangibility and give me an expression of his love in the tangible, because I'm not living by feelings, so I can't be deceived by feelings. So if I don't feel that, he still loves me. But when he's doing that, it's just so cool. But if that's not the case, I'm not wondering what I did wrong. Where's God's presence? Why is not God? What do I, God, hello, hug me, hello. <laughs> that's what we do. Watch. That started happening, and then it got to the point where I would just close the door and not even say anything. <sighs> and then it got to the point, and it's still this way in my life today. That if I just say Jesus from my heart, he's right here. It's really fun. I don't know why he puts me through this publicly. This is him and me stuff. Serious. I'm not messing with you. I'm not being flaky. Jesus. He's right here. If I didn't, right now, he's just on me. If I didn't feel that, he's still here and on me. That's why he does that, because I know that he is. Because any man that comes to him must believe that he is. He just is. And you say, well, no wonder you act the way you do, because you feel him all the time. No, that's not true. I've believed first, and he's given me a stewardship of a whole lot of fun feelings. Feelings are fun. You don't live by them. But they're fun. But you don't live by them. You live by faith. And faith will introduce you to some fun times with God. There's times sitting on my bed where it felt like it was raining on me. I couldn't even describe it. There was times where I felt like I had to cry and was overwhelmed at the level that God loved me. He would just show me 
somehow he would just open up his amazing love for me. I was just bawling control. And sometimes I would laugh unstoppable, just like a hyena. I mean, just laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh like somebody told a joke and, and, and just so overwhelmed. And then there's times to be just bawling. And it, I've had so many, I had a time where the, it just felt like there was a, 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 a tornado or something, a cyclone going around my bed. It was so overwhelming. I curled up in a fetal position in the middle of my bed and, it, and I didn't even want to open my eyes. It wasn't that I was afraid. It was just, it was overwhelming. It felt like the majesty of God was in my room. And I heard a voice say, do you realize I've given you the honor and privilege of loving in my unfailing love? You know what he was saying? He was saying, do you understand I've put my heart inside of you? And he came with a big display to tell me that. <sighs> And then out of that, it was amazing. He speaks that, and the room went, went quiet. And there I am laying whimpering for 45 minutes. I can't even move. And all I would say every once in a while is, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because what I was saying is, I want your heart. All I can do is want it. He's the one that puts it in, yeah? Yeah. It's not, you can't try to love. You can't try to be a good Christian. I just get alone and want him. And he says, oh, that's so cool. I don't know what he does, but he does it. And he shapes you and forms you and molds you in that place of want to. But faith is the only thing that's going to take you there, guys. Faith's the only thing that's going to take you there. That's a good thing. That's not a hard thing because it separates you from living sensual. Do you know how, how the church has been trapped to live sensual? You got to feel good to be doing good. <laughs> but I feel all alone. I'm just, I wish that void would be filled. It gets filled by faith. Father, I thank you I'm not alone that you're right inside of me. And I think, or you drag to the altar and just want peace. Please pray for peace. For, for three weeks, the altar team's surrounding you. God, let her know your peace, God. And it sounds like a viable prayer. The Bible says you have peace with God. Because here's what's happening for those three weeks. You're dragging away and the tears in your eyes are coming from the fact that here I go again and I haven't had peace again. I still don't, and you're so aware of not having peace. And now you're on this desperate thing to just feel peace instead of know God. And now the more you focus on that, the more you're aware of this no peace and it gets to be this huge thing in your life. And now you're crying and next thing you know, well, why won't God give it to me? He mustn't love me. I must have done something really wrong. Maybe there's curses over my life. Maybe it's my great-grandmother. She might still be in the way. And the list goes on. And all it is is the failure to stand up in the midst of feeling no peace and believing he's the Prince of Peace and he's made peace between you and God and you have total access to the Father through the Son and I have peace with God and I'm justified by faith, Romans 5.1. How do you have peace with God? Because I'm justified by faith. See where it comes from first? You go there by faith and you'll have a continual peace in your heart and you'll know that you know that you know. You get there by faith, guys. You follow me? I'm a little late. Oh, there you are. I was just thinking, where's Sue? She was going to come in here. I know she's here. I looked up, there you are. I'm a little late. I want to give you guys a little break, and we're going to have fun this last half with just some real good righteous stuff. Okay? You all cool? Get to meet somebody, say hi to somebody, hug somebody. Go take a break. Go to the potty, whatever you need to do. Hey, man. And we don't have much time left. Twelve-something weeks. It's just going, it's going fast, man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's flying by. You better get in the room. Man, before you get back, we'll be down to about six weeks left. Come on. <laughs> I'm telling you, it'll go fast like that. People said the school, actually the school I didn't think went super fast for me in the fall because it was a big change for me. Like it was just different knowing being here every day and uh, I was getting my grand, now this isn't to get the awe oh, from you guys. If I was getting my granddaughter, I had my granddaughter overnight once a week every week of her life she was four and a half and I I didn't I had her every week overnight when I did the school I couldn't have her overnight because see I knew you would do that <laughs> thing. 
And so we just, so that was a change for me. Uh, I, I live a certain way. I travel on weekends and I get a lot of phone calls at home for just counsel ministry. And, and I do my best to get back to people. Sometimes it's my best doesn't seem good enough, but I do do my best. And uh, so when I did the school, that was all the more time I wasn't at home when I'm normally calling people back on my times home. So it was just a real shift of schedule and a change for me. And it didn't go by like a blur, but the students thought it went fast. <laughs> but, and I think that whole section on healing, I think that felt like four weeks when it was, thank you so much, when it was only really one or two. So amen. Well, we're going to cover a lot of stuff and we're going to take our time, so don't be in a hurry. That's why we got the school set like we do, okay? And it might feel like sometimes I'm saying some of the same things over and over again, and I am. <laughs> All right? And I'm covering some of the same stuff from different angles because people hear and receive on different levels and in different ways and you might use several analogies to make the same point. It's just all God. Go to Colossians chapter 1. I want to talk about just how right you are with God through the blood of Jesus, period. Okay? Because when you tell people they're right with God, their minds kick off and say, yeah, you don't know me. You don't know my life. Well, the only reason you're able to say that, and that's your scenario, is because of this thing you're missing right here that we're about to speak. Because I'm telling you, a, a sin consciousness will produce more sin. A righteous consciousness will produce righteous fruit. Remember yesterday? Become a good tree to bear good fruit. It sounds simple, but it's so profound. It's, it's like, whoa, that is such a simple shift, but it's a huge difference. Being a good tree versus trying to do good is way different. If I already have an A-plus on my report card and I'm already measured up through Christ, I'm already here. I've arrived. I'm home. That sure beats trying to get home. I know people saying, I'm just trying to get back, brother. I'm just trying to get back to where I was. Why are you trying to get back to where you were? What do you mean? Just be there now. Just say, God, thank you. You love me. You've washed me through the blood. I'm home. And it's, I don't know what I was thinking. Yay. I hear that language all the time. Well, I'm just trying to get back, brother. I've just been, and it's been a year and a half now. And they're just trying to get back. See, it's that perspective that's keeping them trapped there. Yeah. And it'll be three and a half years. You know, well, God's just do, he's take, he's doing a work in me. He's taking his time. <laughs> he's already done a work. <laughs> Serious, I'm telling you, your perspective, man, it can be a blessing or a detriment. The eye, the eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is single, if it's healthy, if it's single, your whole body is flooded with light. That scripture is so big to me. I've been preaching that scripture for almost the 16 years I've been saved. The eye is the lamp of your body. That means the view, the perspective, the foundation of your view. If God can change your perspective into truth, he can change your whole life. Just the eye you live through. If your eye changes into truth, even in the heat of adversity, you'll see different than you saw before in adversity. If you understand your life, the value of your life, the calling of your life, the purpose of your created value in the face of adversity, you will handle adversity totally different than before you understood that. Because it looks totally different. You don't even see it for adversity anymore. Like, I don't feel hard-pressed in my life. I've got as many challenges, I promise, as you guys have. And I don't want you to feel sorry for yourself or give yourself an allotment for the flesh. So I'm not comparing. What I'm saying is, your brothers all over the world have the same things going on. Don't you think it's strange? Because then what you do is you build a case for yourself and you say, yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. And you qualify your scenario and make it more difficult than the world around you. And that justifies then your flesh. And you give yourself permission to react instead of to be in Christ. Does, does that make sense? Is that fair what I'm saying? Your eye allows you to do that. The way you see. And all of a sudden, yeah, but brother, you don't understand. You don't know what the last six months has been like. And I know people go through stuff, but this has been crazy and you don't understand. Now, I get that a lot from people when you counsel. What they're doing is they're qualifying their adversity and qualifying their response in the flesh. They're, they're assuring that they're not going to be okay. Even though they're desperately trying to say they want to be okay, their, their perspective is guaranteeing that they're not going to be okay. Because they're starting to feel sorry for themselves. They want you to understand. 
They want you to be sympathetic and sensitive. Look, why don't you lighten up and back off? Don't you know what I've been through? That's the comments that people say. And it sounds, and we get scared of that, and we, we fall into that because we're like, whoa, we need to be more sensitive, yeah. And then we accommodate it, and we allow people to feel victimized. And love is way stronger than that. Love is just, you know, if, I, if I'd have you alone in a room, and, and you would talk like that to me, you'd be amazed how I wouldn't back off even a little bit. I'd say, no, I hear what you're trying to say, and I know that seems right to you, but look at me, honey, listen. And I would go straight into truth. And, and I can honestly tell you, I haven't had a blowout or a fallout with anybody. I haven't had anybody just... Rah! One time on the phone, and that person said that they felt like they hated me for two years because I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with them at how wrong their spouse was. That's what they want. They wanted to use the power of my position to get me in agreement, to use me as a pawn of power. Or well, even Pastor Dan says you're wrong. And they just want me to agree with them and sympathize and be sensitive to their flesh. Refuse to. I won't do that. I will cut that out of you before I permit <laughs> <in> you. <laughs> While we're on the phone talking, I'm zzzz. <laughs> Two years, they said they hated me. When they heard my name, he said their blood, his blood boiled. And he went in to live with somebody. He just had a live-in, backslid, wasn't even thinking God. A live-in girlfriend for two years while he's hurt. Because he's hurt. And he's justifying it because the whole world's against him. And even Pastor Dan won't understand. <laughs> As if I'm the reason for his sin. That's what we do, Right? It's got to be somebody's fault. It's the woman you gave me. That's why I ate the tree. I mean, if you, when they gave me the woman, I'd probably be in a good place right now. Isn't that how we do? That's what sin taught us, self-preservation. He said one morning he was laying on his bed because he came running into church crying and he was holding me and I didn't know what really was going on. He was just crying, saying he was sorry. It was amazing. He uh, was laying on his bed and the Spirit of God came upon him laying on his bed. Lost in sin. That's how much God loves us, guys. Came upon him on the bed and said, where have you been, son? Come home. I love you. Now, somebody was interceding for him, praying. He's shaking on his bed, crying. Got on his knees and worshipped Jesus as Lord. Stood up and thought of me and the bitterness he had towards me. And he got in his car and ran to church and hugged me crying and told me the whole experience. I was like, welcome home. <laughs> I have to be stronger and more secure in my life than his feelings towards me. And at the same time, I can't be hard-hearted and say, well, I don't care what he thinks. See, that's, that's the crossed line we do sometimes. We act so secure that we're like, well, I don't care what people say about me. And that reveals you already do. <laughs> you're, you're trying to harden yourself. Well, it don't matter what you think. Mm, you're saying, yes, it does. <laughs> it is a big one. It's the why, the motive of your heart, the why, the wellspring of, of where you live from, called the why of your life, is what determines your life. You'll never rise above, above your motive, ever. I can, I can talk to Susan, and I can, I can lovingly correct her and I can say everything necessary that I need to to her from a heart of love and it's totally acceptable and covered with grace I can turn around and say the same exact words to her with the need to be right to set her straight or because I feel self-righteous in my heart and I'm just trying to prove her wrong and say the same exact words that are right and be wrong and have no grace on it no it could cause a lot of harm and could say the same exact words from, the, from a different place. Isn't that amazing? The why behind your heart has to become love. And I promise you the whole reason for this school we're going to really talk about becoming love. <laughs> Last school, there was so much stretching in the room it was funny. <laughs> People crying. I look around because I, we're going to go into depth on love and what it is and isn't and how to get there and how to become it. And, and we'll take a long time on that, I promise. And uh, 
Because that it's the goal of our instruction is love. The reason we're not talking about it right away is because because we have to you have to make the pathway to become love. We have to we have to see that we're right with God. If you don't see you're right with God, you won't pursue intimacy with God. You can't love God first. He first loved you. When you realize that, you love Him. You're not trying to love God. You're not trying to obey God. You're in love. Why? Because His love came and taught you what love is. His love overwhelmed you, overtook you, captured you. And now you love. Do you get it? Oh, it's really good. <laughs> So we're not falling in and falling out of love. That is a worldly phrase and that is, is bunk. Love is love. It doesn't fail. It doesn't seek its own. It doesn't take any account of a suffer wrong. Why? Because it's not about itself. It's about others. That's why God's not offended with you. He loves you. That's why he's not repulsed by you. He draws near to you. That's why when sin abounds, grace abounds more because of love. Come on, when sin abounds more, we're repulsed. When sin abounds more, self-righteousness backs away or swings a hammer. When sin abounds, God's grace abounds even more because of love. Because what he says is, that is so not who you are. That is so not who I created you to be. There's so much more to your life than that. I love you. So powerful. I say it all the time. Did he put his son on the cross because we've been such wretched sinners? Well, he had to die because we sinned. But he didn't put his son on the cross because we're wretched sinners. He put his son on the cross because we're lost sons. Son for son. He didn't die because of your mess. He died because he created you to be his and you were lost. He's bringing you home. He died to get you home. He died to get you back. Jesus didn't die on the cross to take you to heaven or just because you sinned. He died on the cross because you're lost sons and he wants to get that and make that clear. We don't even preach that. We, my whole life going to church I was so sin conscious every time I heard the gospel because this poor man Jesus had to get pummeled and beat because I'm such a knucklehead. And then I got resentment in my heart. I got anger in my heart because I wanted to do things that I wasn't supposed to do and it became a should and shouldn't, a do and don't, and a should to, ought to, need to. Well, I really shouldn't be doing this when I want to. You know, it's like you have to explain things. We, if, if we get into even the sexual side of things in the school at all, like you can't just tell two young people, look, it ain't God and you shouldn't be doing that. It's not the will of God. It's called fornication. Don't sleep with her. What are you doing, man? You shouldn't be doing that. It's not God. And they go, okay. And they, but I want to. And the rest of the relationship, they're like, oh, I want, you know, we shouldn't, yeah, we shouldn't, but I want to. They don't understand why, and we don't give them any understanding. So they're just driven by feelings, and they're trying to, to obey. And sooner or later, they go, oh, oh, oh. that's what happens. You did understand my gyrations, right? Okay. And because it's like because it, it, it's that movie thing then and then it's that story on and it feeds that emotional thing all the more because it's like this whim of oh yeah, oh, yeah ah, 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 right and then oh my god oh my god oh, Jesus oh, Jesus <laughs> and then a week later yeah right and after a while you cross that you, and then they say, you know it's not even a week it's just oh, sorry oh, sorry oh, sorry well God knows our heart and it's because we force people into this religious, legalistic, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be doing that. Well, if you love God, you wouldn't do that. It's because we don't understand. We don't see the value and the honor of our lives. We don't understand love. We don't, young men don't understand what it means to honor a woman in true love instead of need a woman and fulfill his desire. Women don't know what it means to stand in honor and draw Christ up and out of a man and know that they're a prize to be won and they're worth that. So we're just into the the heat of it all and want people to think we're cute and pretty and I want you and you want me oh, and that's enough today you want me yeah okay I'm wanted that is so shallow such a lie how this is school 
<laughs> Welcome to school. <laughs> we'll get on some of this stuff. It sounds like we're trying to get there now. <laughs> Lord, where do I go? Can I do this? Because I'm not. Oh. Serious. I, I, it's not about don't do this because. We need to see the honor. The honor of covenant and love. And how, how can I be in a relationship with somebody and look them in the eyes and tell them I love them and turn right around and feel like I hate them and talk bad about them? It's because of the whole time I'm living under the mask of self-centered desire in the flesh and I'm trying to find identity through that relationship. So at all costs... I'm trying to find identity. So when I say I love, it's actually it's at the expense of that person. Because it's still all about me. And guys pursue that and learn how to play that. And girls, forgive me for this. But if your identity, because you're created so precious and valuable in God and Satan loves to mock that, you become so vulnerable, so insecure that you just become easy prey when you don't know who you are. You will fall prey to any whim and any fancy of just that you're special, you're important, you turn me on, you're awesome, you're the best. Really? Because you don't believe that, you want that, you want to believe that, and you think that's making it real. It's such a lie from hell. That's why it never feels good later. I've had young teenage girls, countless, makes me cry, I have a hard time talking about it come to me crying in that scenario over and over and I plead with them, hold their hands, hold them like they're my own daughter, speak to them and plead with them and tell them who they are and they get back in that rat race, get on the computer, get caught up in the talk and next thing you know they're, they're far away from truth and they're right back in the same slime and crying because they slept with Billy and just met him yesterday but he made me feel important I ask girls, why did you do it? Why did you, why did you do it? Oh, I just felt, I don't know, for a minute I felt special and my mind said this isn't going to make me special but I felt like I needed to feel special so I just I felt so I've been in that way too many times with young ladies. Way too many. Breaks my heart. <laughs> okay, God, I'm not doing good. I'm in trouble. <laughs> All it takes is a few integral Christians to rise up and say, you know what, let's call this thing what it is. It's not normal. It's not who we're created to be. We're not chasing after the world. Any topic that Satan would exploit to the level he has relationships and sexuality, there must be an amazing holy root there. There must be something so pure and so beautiful and so wonderful if he would take so much effort to drive us in a direction. True? I mean, he touches us in that area at a young age. I was 11, and I found a pornographic magazine on the railroad tracks. And I picked it up, I went, what? I'm 11, I'm sitting on the train dock on a Sunday afternoon, everything's shut down, and I'll never forget that I sat there, and it corrupted, it just put things in my, I was like, And I was captured. Eleven years old. Eleven. Lasso. Marked with self-centered desire. Fantasy. Me, 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 me. At the expense of human flesh. In the name of love for me. <sighs> okay. We're shifting the gear. I just got grace to shift a gear. I don't know why I went there so serious like I did for that little bit of time, but we went there. It's on tape. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm still having a little trouble. That thing I just talked about, the only reason we have that capacity is because I'm just being straight. I'm not looking around right now on purpose. I don't want, I'm not talking to anybody in this room. I don't preach that way. The only reason we have that capacity to live that way and get thrown around like that is because we failed to see who we are through Him, receive righteous identity, and have God reality. The only reason we can live that way is because we're still searching. It means we're in identity crisis. 
And we're trying to find ourselves through life and through people. Through surface words and expressions. And the world and the movies and the commercials are doing their best to keep you captured. And for some reason, we keep feeding on that stuff as if it's our calling or something. Okay, now I'm really good. I'm set up. Yep, yeah. You guys don't know how it is with me when I'm preaching, but man, I could not read this for about 10 minutes. Colossians chapter one, verse 21. Watch this. We're so set up right now. This is good. And you, you, he's talking to you and me. You who were once alienated in enemies in your mind by wicked works. Do you see what happened? Satan came and corrupted the mind of man. He got him self-centered, self-desiring, selfish. When man ate the tree... That, that thing called love in him that he was created to be got contorted and twisted and became selfish and loveless. So love went to selfishness. There's no selfishness in love. There's no love in selfishness. It's impossible to have both. Now we're growing. That doesn't mean we can't grow. That doesn't mean you're cut off because you acted in some selfishness. What matters is that when you see it for what it is, call it what it is, Thank God it's not who you are and grow in this place so that gets clipped out of you. Stop blaming your selfish actions on other people's deficits and misnomers and excusing it away because you'll continue to flow in it. You're giving it permission. I don't care how unjust you treat me. I have no permission to live for my flesh. You're not my barometer or my standard. I love you. I'm called to love you. You're not my reason for being less than who he is. And if I'm making you, I'm way deceived. Well, I wouldn't feel this way if they wouldn't have said that. What is that? That is a flesh excuse. You're pampering your flesh. Stop that. Well, I wouldn't feel this way if they didn't say that. Well, you do feel this way because they said that. So what's that reveal? Shame on them? No. There's a place for you to grow. Why does that move you so much? They're not Lord. They're not Jesus. They're just another person looking for attention. And if they knew Christ, they wouldn't have said what they said. So why are they becoming your barometer? You get it? But I'm telling you, that sells with us. And we'll talk to a good friend and say, and and she'll say, or he'll say, because it's not a girl thing, it's it's, it's all of us. Uh, So when I said she, I just wanted to say, or he. Uh, They said that? I can't believe they said that. Yeah, they said, man, that must have really hurt. You better believe it hurt. Man, I'm sorry they said that. That's, That's normal everyday conversation in the church. How you doing today? Well, I was doing good. What do you mean? Well, I got on Facebook and I saw so-and-so posted this. I can't believe they said that. All I meant was this when I wrote this. And we get caught into this petty circle of nothing. And it robs your whole day and the rest of your life until you get a grip on it. And you can go to church and sing the most amazing songs (laughs) and leave and live with that mindset. And then your friend says, they posted what? Well, I'd be ticked if they posted. What? Or they said what? What? Doesn't just have to be Facebook, Internet. I'm not bashing that. I'm not against stuff. I'm just, we just, we, we, things are a blessing. The Internet's been such a blessing to Neck Ministries and getting teachings out. But, but it can be just as much a detriment if you don't have self-control in your life. Anything that's good can become bad, right? I mean, was the garden bad? Man misused it. Whoa. Oh, that was a revelation. Write that down. I'm going to preach that sometime. (laughs) Tear that and give that to me later. (laughs) I'll put that in my notes. Serious. Everything from God is good. It's how man uses it. True? You who were once what? Alienated enemies in your mind. So you're the for me or against me. Your mind's either working for the kingdom or against the kingdom. Jesus said that himself. That's amazing. By wicked works, look, this is incredible. Yet now he reconciled. Who reconciled? He did. So he wants to reconcile. Come on, this is simple. This is his idea. This is his aggression. This is his first move. He's made a move towards us. Who reconciled us? He did. 
So he wants us reconciled. He did this. He made the move. You got to see this. So look, how did he do it? In the body of his flesh through death. Why? To present you holy and blameless. Wait, I was just wicked and alienated in my mind and an enemy. Just a sentence ago, I was an enemy. All that's happened is he died for me and now I'm before God presented blameless and holy because of that? See, that truth is designed to change the wickedness of the mind and repent the heart and cause the heart to change. Do you see here that you've done nothing but be wicked in your mind and alienated in an enemy? That's all we've been, guys. <laughs> Even if some of us didn't seem so bad, we were still sold under sin. Some of us just manifested worse than others. <laughs> <laughs> but even the sweetest little Aunt Millie that gives pies to everybody still has enough issues that Jesus needs to shed his blood. <laughs> it's just true. <laughs> because she has the ability to be hurt. She has the ability to take life personal. As sweet as she is, she has the ability to let just the unforgiveness just come out of the corner of her mouth at times because she's holding on against certain things and won't forget. But yet she's sweet and we like to be around her because she's just not as nasty as some of us. So <laughs> we take the best we can find and it's sweet Aunt Millie. But she needs Jesus. It's like little children. They're precious. My little granddaughter is just, I love her. But she's going to need born again. I didn't teach her selfishness, I promise. But I've seen it in her life. <laughs> Where'd she get that? It's just in her nature. Came with the package called born in Adam, must be born again. I didn't have to teach her how to whine and say, give me. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't teach her how to like, now Hannah, honey, don't you touch that, okay? No, no. No, don't you touch that. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then what's Hannah do when she's just wee little? What's Hannah do? I said, Hannah. You know, or, or better yet, as she gets a little older, see, because when she's really little, there's a sense of innocence, even though it's got a twist to it. She just does that when she's real little. Because I'm like, no, honey, that's, I don't want you to break that. I don't want you. But now another year passes by. And now Hannah doesn't just go like this. Here's what Hannah does. Or just with a little finger. And you're like, who taught her that? You didn't have to. It was already in her. <laughs> I'm glad it got out of you. <laughs> but see, we see the sweetness in her then. We can see the value in her then. She's a child. She's precious. We even give more grace at that age. And we're like, oh, she's just a kid. As you get a little older, then we put more expectations. You're not just a kid now, and da, 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 da. But until the nature changes, until they're born again, they can't produce anything else. And they can put on a good show and smile at you and uh, behind you. And then we get all hurt. I can't believe you did that. And you live like a snake and you're like a Jekyll and Hyde. It's all you know until you're born again. Because you're an enemy and alienated by the wickedness that's going through your mind. But... In that, God didn't say shape up or ship out. God didn't say, look, you guys need to get it straight or you're going to forever stay crooked. It's on you guys. Come on. No. He put his own son on the cross and put our sin on him to show that we're more than what we've been living. That's what God's trying to say. Now, unfortunately, at large, we don't preach it that way. The cross reveals your value. It doesn't point out your sin. The cross removes your sin. The cross takes your sin away. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's not the issue now. Sonship is the issue. Right standing with God is the issue. Righteousness is the issue. Being restored and redeemed back to the Father is the issue. And if you'll start there, 
and understand that in the beginning, you will run well. It's your place to accept that. That's where you come in and live by faith. And even though some of those wretched, wicked things still try to whisper, old blasts from the past still try to remind old things that used to own you and mock the gospel through your life and your created value and all that stuff, and, yet, and you didn't even know that was going, still come to see if they can have a piece of you. That's where you have to stand. I am so much more than what just went through my mind. Father, I thank you for the love you're building in my heart and I thank you for holiness and I thank you for loving me and receiving me. Thank you for teaching me to live set apart and sanctified. Your divine nature is ruling me. I am escaped from the world that's ruled through lust. I thank you for love. You just, you gotta stay in that place and cast everything down that rises above him. How do you do that? I bind you, I rebuke you, I bind you. No, you'd be doing that all day. You go through seasons in your life where something just comes and tries to rock you and it won't come out of your head. Who's ever had that? And you're like, brr, brr, brr. <laughs> <laughs> Who's ever had that? Just this thing that you keep thinking and you seem conscious of it and you don't want to think it. And you're like, why do I keep thinking that? And it's like you can't turn it off. Did you ever had that? I've had that. <clears throat> you know what those seasons have done for me? Made me know God more, love God more, and be sure, more sure, sure, sure of who I am. (laughs) Well, that sure beats letting it sell you out, buy you out, sell you cheap, and take on the identity of what you're thinking instead of what he said. First of all, our hearts are pure enough to care about what's running through our minds. And if we were ruled by wicked minds, where's the attack point of the enemy? That's the only place he can try to get a foothold to get you to believe wrong. Get you to think wrong, see wrong. That's why it says the weapons of your warfare, 2 Corinthians 10. Even though you walk in the flesh, that means you have a body. It doesn't mean you live by the dictates of flesh, but you have a flesh body. Even though you're housed by flesh, the weapons of your warfare aren't carnal, but mighty for the pulling down strongholds that's fortresses and and castles of wrong believing that have been built up in our lives for years truth comes and devastates a man it's like dynamite at the foundation (laughs) truth just blows that stuff apart you get it Jericho and the fortified city and just marching around the shouting wonder if you just keep marching in truth yeah. wonder if that thing just keeps there and yeah 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 you just keep marching in truth and you start believing it and next thing you know Jesus and <laughs> come on yeah. these stories are there for a reason they point to truth they point to Christ and the finished work strongholds where's the strongholds build your mind and all of a sudden you just all of a sudden you just can't believe You say, well, I just can't believe God could love me. I just can't believe. Well, honey, it doesn't even matter that you feel that way and see that. It says he does here. At some point, you have to honor his word above how you feel because he honored his word above his name. And and, and you've got to honor his word. So just begin to thank him that he does love you. I've taken people that road already where, where they say, I don't even feel. Well, just begin to just sit on your bed. Lord, I don't feel like you love me, but you have to because your word says so. And one thing I do believe is this is your word. And you start somewhere, you find something they can believe and you just spring them into that and watch what God built. You get what I'm saying? See, we, we, we are microwave folks. We don't understand the beauty of cultivating something in faith to where it becomes their reality instead of just the moment and experience. We try to settle a lot of this stuff with ministry. And... Uh, if there's any area I, I could get criticized in my life and ministry, it would be in this area where, you know, because I'm not against ministry. I, 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 think, I think we're drawing identity from ministry a lot of times, and we think it's a ministry issue. It's not. It's a foundation of faith issue. You don't need as much ministry as you think. There's a ministry called the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is amazing on the earth if you'll enter into him by faith. If a Christian would stop waiting to feel delivered and get along with God and start thanking him they are delivered, 
that would change your whole life. If a Christian would just get alone with God and start declaring that they have peace with the Father through the Son, they would know that peace. Instead of running to places where they're trying to get the impartation of peace. Because if you don't have the foundation of faith, life will shake you. If, if faith isn't your foundation, life will shake you. And you'll need another manifestation. I'm not against the working of Holy Spirit and the stuff He does. I could tell you a lot of stories myself. And I've been in a lot of places where cool things happen. And God just turned on the lights in people and delivered people and did amazing things. And the work of Spirit is amazing. Holy Spirit's incredible. But He still wants you to live from the foundation of faith. Because if you don't, life will rock you. Won't it? And sometimes everything lines up as a strategy and position to revive a stronghold and get you to believe something that's not true. And it's calculated, it's strategic, it's behind the scenes. You'd be amazed how that stuff works. And all of a sudden you give yourself permission for being a mess because one, two, three, four in a row, ha. Ah, and then you say, no wonder I feel this way. And we sell out. And if somebody tries to minister to us, we defend our position and say, well, you haven't been in my shoes. <laughs> Isn't that common language? Strongholds, you cast them down. Bring them into obedience according to Christ. You hold them captive. What's that mean? That means everything that violates your heart and conscience that comes through your mind you bring into obedience according to truth. It doesn't mean you fight the thought and battle the devil. You yield to truth. So if you're thinking a wicked thing, you don't even have a problem, do you? Because you already have an answer and you have truth and you have a covenant. <laughs> so who cares the trash that just went through your mind when you can look up and say, God, I so thank you that you love me and that I'm clean in your sight. And the Lord, my heart is never to sin, but Lord, I'm for you. And I just love you and thank you for building me in the things of the spirit. And I thank you my life is so worth living and I am clean and pure in you. And that little thing that just spoke that to you is going. <laughs> and Father, I just want to let you know. <laughs> But I am so glad for the day you came and changed my life forever. That old man has so died and I am alive and new and my life is so worth living in you. And I... You know why he would look like that? Because he's used to going and Christians graying out and taking to heart what they hear and then going to ask for prayer because they sold short. Asking for prayer just because of what they're thinking. And then, you know, what the church does? The church accommodates and says, well, you're probably only halfway saved or there must be some lingering thing in you. It's not in you. It's outside trying to get back in. It's the biggest mistake we make in the church. I'm convinced of it. I would hang on a cross for that one. The church could crucify me for that one because that one's gotten so big in the church that we're trying to get everything out of each other. And all we're doing in the process is saying that it's in us. Just because I have a thought, don't tell me it's in me. It's trying to get back in. It wants me again. And as soon as I submit to fear and call you and say, you need to deliver me, I think I have a stronghold of fear. I think I have something in my lineage, some curse. I think I need fears rooted in me. Now I've just opened myself up for it to have a home. I don't have a spirit of fear. So if I'm feeling fear, it has nothing to do with the kingdom in me. It has nothing to do with Christ in me. I don't need you to pray for me to cast it out of me. I need you to build me up in who I am. Yes. You overcome lies with truth. <laughs> I'm real strong on that one. I'm real passionate. <laughs> I really am. There was a time in my life I heard curse words towards Holy Spirit for nine months. I had folks that do certain levels of ministry presumptuously say, well, if you'd have come to us, we could have set you free. You wouldn't have had to go through nine months. That's what they said. <laughs> Arrogance. They're going to find one day they're very wrong. That's high-minded. Because Holy Spirit told me that every time I heard the voice to tell Holy Spirit how I really feel about Him, and after nine months, I had a relationship, six months, I mean, I had a relationship with Holy Spirit that was so incredible and so real at nine months old in the Lord because it was three months saved when I started having a voice. 
what those ministers would have told me was is that I was only partially saved and there was something still in me from before. And it would have had to surrender my identity and that thing that I was already established and I had to give that up to get ministry. I ain't giving nothing up. <laughs> it's way too late and ain't nobody talking me out of this. It isn't a need to be right. It's not elevating my personal experience above others. It's the gospel that makes you free. It's not going on a witch hunt and rolling stones and opening doors. It's proclaiming truth. And if you'll continue in his word, you'll know the truth. Not continue in your feelings and what seems right and other people's analogies, but if you'll continue in his word. Well, I don't feel clean. Are you clean? Well, I don't feel clean. Are you clean? But I don't feel clean. Are you clean? See, that's all I know. That's all I'll counsel you. So it doesn't even matter to me that you don't feel clean. It matters to me that I can look you in the eyes and tell you you are. <laughs> and I'll camp there long enough till you believe it. And if you choose not to believe it, you'll just have to deal with that and answer for that. But that's your privilege, but you're called to believe it. And here's what I've been told by a lot of folks. Well, Dan, you don't understand. Not everybody can believe that. So then we accommodate their unbelief and come up with another way. I will not accommodate your unbelief. I will call you to rise to faith. If God said that every man has the measure of faith, don't you tell me that not everybody can believe that when he called us to live by faith. Yes, you can. I will not accommodate the weakness of flesh. I will drive it out of you or you will run away. One or, one or the other, you'll go find another way. Here's the good news. You can be free right now, starting by faith. You can have joy right now. You can know you're clean right now. You want me to prove it? Because this isn't my doctrine. I read this book. <laughs> I have lived in this book. I haven't lived here. And I haven't lived through experiences. I don't think much of experiences. I won't let experiences define God or your life. This is who you are. And I'm real adamant about this one. I've seen this whole topic that I'm on right now do so much damage and subvert the clear preaching of the finished work of Christ to where we honor what he's done and become a living product of his finished work. <laughs> In the body of his flesh, through verse 22, look at this, through death. Why? To present you what? <laughs> Holy, blameless, and above, oh my goodness, and above what? above reproach. You guys understand that? So you're not being scolded, corrected, fault-finded with. You're not, you're not, man. He loves you. You're holy. What else are you? <laughs> Through what? Wait, oh, wait. A verse ago, I was wicked, alienated, and an enemy. Now he reconciled what was wicked, alienated, and an enemy by one thing, the body of his flesh through death. And now I'm standing before him blameless, holy, blameless, and above reproach. Now watch, watch. This is the word of Almighty God. That's your position right now through Christ. Do you see that in your Bible? If indeed... You, who? If indeed you continue in the faith. You accept this, you believe this. You're grounded, you're steadfast, and you're not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard. Well, unfortunately, many of us haven't heard this hope and this gospel. 
Some of us have only heard, look, God knows you're going to sin. You're always going to sin. We're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to mess up. Thank God for the blood. At least he loved us. There's a way to heaven. He'll forgive us. Just, man, when you, you know, just make sure you repent for your sin. Who's grew up with that one? <laughs> I am so not thinking sin. <laughs> sin. Sin and the devil are two things that I totally don't think about at all, ever. Think about Jesus. I think about him loving me. I think about Hannah. <laughs> You're awesome. I do. I think about Hannah. Every once in a while, I say, oh, she's so awesome. When I, this won't embarrass you. When I first met Hannah, she has this heart like this, but at the same time, discouraged things. I had stuff hidden here when I first met you. The very first time I met you. And God gave me grace. And actually, when I was speaking to her, he let me know what she was thinking. And I said, because I know what you're thinking. And she said, what am I thinking? That's what she did. She, you know, she was real humble. But when I said I knew what she was thinking, her little hand came on a little hair. What am I thinking? <laughs> She's like, I didn't do that. <laughs> Having fun with this. But I said, well, right now you're thinking this and this. And she went and just started to cry. I said, honey, God knows you. God loves you. God knows what's going on here. This is a detriment. This is, tra- this is a trap. You're a woman of God. You're a precious girl. And I just love, I just have such a love for her. For everybody, but I love you. <laughs> but I just remember that. And I, and I remember, so here's good people. And the only place Satan can try to hit is here. To where all of a sudden you don't even think you're good. In the sense of wanting to do right. So where you actually just sell out even your good holy desire and your God-given not as I wasn't where she was at. What I'm saying is that's the process. That's the intention. And that's the struggle. And then you don't look in the mirror and feel good because you feel this stuff and you're questioning and you're never assured. And, and now you're lost and alone and now you're seeking value and seeking identity and your esteem is shattered and it's all lies. Because the whole time that's happening, your life's worth his death. Oh, <laughs> You know there's a strategy out there and you know we've been marred by the fall when you can have ten, nine truths on, on, on your hands. Nine truths. You could just speak off nine amazing life-changing truths and somebody will grab this tenth finger and say, yeah, but, and come up with one little derogatory phrase and sell out all the nine truths with the one little negative thought. And we, it's like we are, we are programmed to believe the lie and the truth is screaming from a tree. I love you, you're amazing, you're created in my image, your life lived is worth my death, I'm gonna rise and justify you, it is finished, your sons and daughters rise up and be free. And we're like, yeah, well, I don't feel like a son. (laughs) If indeed you continue what? In the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the gospel. So good. It is. Down in, in, in verse 27, he talks about Christ in us, the hope of glory. And it's him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ Jesus. You're already there. You have to see that you've been made whole. You've been made free. There's this pastor. There, there was this person. They, they, they were smoking. And they couldn't stop smoking. They were, they were consumed. So the church is praying, be delivered, addictive spirit. Come off. You know how we are. You know what I mean? Well, everybody. But I mean, telling you, we're all this. Yeah. And deliverance stuff. And, 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 and I've seen people totally free. I've prayed for several people myself that smoked 25, 30 years. A girl on heroin. Boom. Got free in an instant. But this case, who's ever seen that there's some cases people seem sincere. I don't want to do this anymore. And yet they're still doing it. And they're crying. They come to church. They're a little grayed out now because the conviction level and, and has risen up. And, and now they're still doing it and then condemnation takes its place and they're like man and and, and, and who's ever seen that and you're praying for them and they just can't stop and then we say well if you you know and then we revert into some other stuff if we're not careful in legalism and then we put even more bricks on their shoulders here's what this pastor said to this guy I love this it's a real story 
I just won't give names and pastors or people. They freak out over this stuff. Because we're legalistic and don't realize it a lot of times. This pastor said, listen, I'm not praying for you to be delivered. You are delivered through Christ Jesus. You have been delivered from the power of darkness. Now, you gave yourself to this thing and it's owned you. It's wrapped its chain around you, whatever. But the truth is you have been delivered by Jesus. And I want you to keep declaring that and thank God he loves you and that you have been delivered through the blood and stripes of Jesus. You have been placed in the kingdom of the son of his love that darkness has no hold on you. He said, and I want you to mainly pray it when that desire to smoke and all that comes on you. And even if you have one in your mouth smoking it, as you're smoking it, you look up and you say, Father, this is not who I am. I thank you. You've delivered me from the power of darkness. He said, I can't do that. I'll be a flat out hypocrite. He said, no, you won't be a hypocrite because a hypocrite's a play actor. A hypocrite is somebody that says they want change but doesn't. You're in bondage, sir. You want change. It doesn't make you a hypocrite to smoke that cigarette and proclaim that. A hypocrite's a play actor. They put on a mask. They say one thing and mean another. That's a hypocrite. Get that in your understanding because we use that word loosely, hypocrite. People say, how can I pray for the sick if I'm sick? That would make me a hypocrite. That has nothing to do with a hypocrite. It actually means I value the gospel and the truth more than my experience. And it doesn't matter if I'm sick. I'm praying for you because I'm called to and I have the right to. So in your face sickness, I'm manifesting the kingdom. Bam. And then the devil's saying, well, you're a hypocrite. What do you mean? A hypocrite's a play actor. A hypocrite's hanging out in all the right places and saying you want change and really not wanting change trying to fit in and find identity in more places than one. That's what I was in my teenage years. I went to a youth group because I fit in there and found friends there and then I had my friends from school that had nothing to do with youth group and I put on this jacket and this face and then I put on this jacket and this face. I acquired this language and this language because it gave me two circles of friends and I felt more accepted and I had more avenues of fellowship. I did that my whole teenage life. I was messed up, man. <laughs> See, and Jesus got a hold of me. <laughs> See? <laughs> and here I am. You guys got me up here teaching, and I was a mess. <laughs> that ought to give you some serious hope, huh? <laughs> I got to finish this. Every man complete in Christ, complete in Christ, complete in Christ. Look at Colossians 2. I didn't, I didn't get on this like I wanted to. There's obviously some things we need to cover yet, but I want you to see how powerful this is. Do you understand that I'm calling you by faith? Uh, I'm sorry. The, the guy with the cigarette, I do need to finish quick. I just, I, I was cutting it off. I thought I don't, but I do need to finish it because he's smoking a cigarette and he's talking to the Lord. Father, I thank you that you love me. And he's feeling totally freaked out, guilty, and feeling like a hypocrite while he's doing it. He's like, this is nuts. Father, I thank you you've delivered me from the power of darkness. And I thank you you've translated me in the kingdom of the son of your love that you absolutely love me. So a couple days go by, he runs out of cigarettes. He thinks, okay, I'm not going to buy another pack. I'm not going to buy another pack. I'm not going to buy another pack. Finds himself pulling into the rudders, buying another pack. He's going in there, man. He's kind of dragging a little. Here I go. I'm just going to buy another pack. I'm going to smoke the whole other pack. He's buying the pack and he's walking to his truck and the words of the pastor are going through him and he's going, Father, I thank you that I have been delivered from the power of darkness and I've been translating the kingdom to the son of your love and you love me, God, and I thank you for freedom through Christ. And he opens up the pack, pulls that cigarette and he's smoking it and he's praying this and he's faithfully doing this and more so every time he starts smoking a cigarette, he's about three, four cigarettes into that pack. He just realized he hadn't smoked for a long time. He was driving home from work. I love the gospel. So much freedom in that story. He's just driving home from work because he's not a hypocrite. He wants change. He's compelled. He doesn't have the ability in his own strength. He, he, he can't stop, but he wants to. And I'm not even bashing cigarette smoking. I'm saying he got to a place where he didn't want that. You've never heard me stand up here and say, you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't this, you shouldn't. Not, it's, that's, that's a zero to me. Now you fall in love with Jesus and your life will pan out in what it should and shouldn't be. He realized coming home from work that he hadn't smoked for a while. 
And he went, and he looked, and he had absolutely thought of his cigarettes, which normally when he thought of a cigarette, he'd have to have one. He thought of his cigarettes and he didn't even want one. In fact, he didn't even relate to smoking. And he just started freaking out in his truck. Just freaking out in love. Freaking out. So it wasn't about a big long line of deliverance. It wasn't about taking him through every channel of every sin of everybody that ever lived in his heritage. It was about him believing that he's one with Christ and one in Christ. And the Christ in him is the hope of the manifestation of God. And in the face of my physical experience, there's something in my heart that says I'm more than this. I don't want this. And this chain is not greater than Christ. He will break off chains and he will open prison doors. He's my freedom. It wasn't about ministry and prayer for him. It was about a foundation of faith and identity. Make sense? A story like that is so beautiful to me. There's lots of stories. There's lots of stories. There's also stories of deliverance. I was at work. I was talking to a man. I'm talking to a man from me to you, Susan. We're talking. From here to Trish was a guy sitting on a forklift. And I'm talking. And this guy's asking because I'm pouring out my heart for him. I don't even realize he's sitting there. But the guy sitting here who was a chain smoker called me in the morning. We worked till 2.30 in the morning. It was uh, 10 hour shifts, 4.30 to 2.30. And I went home. In the morning early, this man that's sitting over here calls my home, freaked out, chain smoker, going through divorce, a wreck, lighting one off of one, just a wreck, calls me, freaked out, said he realized, he just realized he hasn't had a cigarette since sitting on his forklift when I was talking to Mike, and he said, I know it was then because this peace came on me that I haven't known, and I didn't understand it, and I just realized since that moment, I haven't even thought of lighting a cigarette. I'm so freaked out what's going on. <laughs> and I said, you got a minute, right? And we talked. You know what I did? I went right over to his house, took a Bible with me. He got born again. We baptized him. He got saved. Sitting from here to there, listening in, acting like he wasn't. And what he was longing for, peace, came through the true source of peace. Holy Spirit, boom, through Jesus Christ. And he called me to find out what the heck was going on. Isn't that fun? Yeah. But there's times where... Who's prayed for people and they're just instantly healed? Boom, you've seen instant healings. Then you've prayed for people and it just doesn't seem like it's happening. And you prayed and you prayed and you prayed. Who's had those experiences? If you're not careful, it gets in here and we try to answer that. Let's stop doing that and let's just stay on faith in the finished work of Christ and let's stay on Him. And let's not make faith a method, a hit, miss, win, or lose, or a plug we pull in and out. Same way with people changing lives. When, when Destiny's daddy, Todd, he would call me. He, he first got saved and he's all zealous and excited, but he starts slipping back into crack. And every once in a while he'd call me and cry. And I did it again, man. I did it again, man. I said, okay. I said, well, listen, here's what's important. It's not who you are. And I kept preaching righteousness to him. I didn't say, you did what? Man, you got to stop that. I kept telling him, it's not who you are. And you know what I upheld in him? I kept upholding in him. Here's the deal, Todd. This is the first time in your life you care about what you're doing. For years you've been in this bondage and you could have cared less and you already had planned how you were going to do it the next time. Now you're not trying to slip and when you do, you're heartbroken and you're calling me with tears. This gospel's changing your life. Yeah, but dude, I used, I used. I understand that. But keep growing in who you're becoming and who you are in Christ. This truth... You can hear this wrong if you want. I'm glad he's calling me because I know what I'm going to tell him. I'm not so sure what others would have told him. I think at the cost of identity, I think they'd have took him back to his roots or something. Todd doesn't have a grid for that because he's never been taught that. (laughs) So when he gets around it, it kind of freaks him out. (laughs) He he talks a little harsher on that topic than I do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he really does. <laughs> you know why? Because it's the gospel that made him free. It's the revelation of Jesus that made him free. It's not because I programmed him to be against something. I never even talked to him about any of that stuff. I just pre- he came to me after he started getting known and traveling. 
and asked me, what's all this about this, this, and this? What is that? And I said, well, we talked a little. He said, it's everywhere. I said, I know. Because we're accommodating unbelief in a lot of cases. Not in every. There's a, there's a place for Holy Spirit to touch somebody in their life in an area where they haven't gotten past since age eight. I've seen it and I understand it. But when you think it's your calling and that everybody has to have that, you're not building faith in people. You're actually telling them why they might have a problem. And if you preach that everybody has to have that, you're doing injustice to this book. Holy Spirit, by the gift of the Spirit, will take you there if necessary. Don't look for issues, look for Jesus. You hear me? Yes. We'll probably get on that a little bit at times, but I, I want you to know I'm not projecting against ministries. I, I honor the gospel. And I'm reading here that I am, I am blameless and holy and above reproach if I walk by faith. It doesn't mean I have hidden issues and strongholds and hooks and closet doors. That man died, I have Jesus. And there's some ways I've been trained to live and think that Jesus is changing as I continue in him. Follow me? Some of this deliverance you experience, you don't even know it when it's Holy Ghost. You're just in a bedroom seeking him and something gets ripped out of your life and you don't even know it. And there's times you're alone with him seeking and you get this amazing awareness of... And this thing will manifest, and you go, oh my God. And I was like, Jesus, I, whew, and it's done. And people have had to, I love those. That's Jesus walking you through stuff. We'd have a whole lot more of that if we were seeking him. <laughs> like Don said on Sunday, I saw one to hug him. He said, some of us have been so busy on the phone, we should have been busy at the throne. <laughs> and I said, oops, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> I swore I wasn't going to preach it, but I just did. It's true. It's true. We don't need as much ministry as we think. I'm closing. Oh, it's late. We'll pick up a Colossians 2. Colossians 2 is so good, but it'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> That's the good thing about the word. It'll be here tomorrow. And you know what else is cool about that? It'll say the same thing that it says today. Yes. This thing is not going to turn, shift, or change. Your circumstances might, but this won't. So don't you. Let's pray. Let's lift our voice and pray to God and thank Him for today and just increase and just grow in us. But we're going to cover this. I got on some other topics today. That's just the way school is. Uh, that's the way I am and in, in the Lord. But, but I really want to nail down righteousness. But you can start building on that today. You leave here today knowing you're what? Holy, blameless, and above reproach. Guys, that's you right now because He died. He died to present you that way. You have to receive that. You have to put that on. You're the one that, that keeps on that righteousness. God will never take off your robe of righteousness. The devil has no authority to do it. All he can do is trick you out of it and you can undress. That's the only way you won't walk in righteousness if you undress. Why would you undress when you look so good in him? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> So, Father, we just thank you for the finished work of Jesus. We believe the gospel. And in the face of feelings in this room, Lord, I know that there's people here for many different reasons. And I'm aware that there's people here for, for just being established in certain revelations through truth. And, 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 and some don't feel certain ways. And it seems this, seems that. I thank you that today... You begin right now today to root them and ground them in a sincere foundation, a true foundation of faith that rests simply on the finished work of Christ that permits them and allows them to open up their heart and soul to you and say, thank you that I'm clean. Not that it's a repeated prayer led from the pulpit, but then in their heart they can say, thank you that I'm blameless. Thank you that I'm above reproach in your sight. You are not scorning me. You are not adjusting me. You're not criticizing me. You're doing nothing but loving me. Thank you for building me in this truth. And I stand steadfast and I'm rooted in this. I choose faith today and I'm living by faith. And the way it seems or seems not is irrelevant today. The way it is through Christ is my true identity. I'm going to grow in it, God. And thank you for helping me. 
Father, I thank you that over every person right now in this place, that that would be the mindset, the heart, and the release of grace upon us as a class today. And I thank you we're rooted, grounded, and established in this love. And I thank you nothing can move us away. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 See, if you open up your theology, big...